So that was a little fun video, kind of like kicking open our open day. Um, who am I? I'm going to be your host for the next two and a half hours. So giddy up. Um, I'm, I, I'm the active creative director at The Rookies. I'm a foundations mentor here at CT Spectrum. I also work with Epic Games and ArtStation. I've been doing video games for about 20 years now. So if you have any specific questions for me along the way, um, just shout them out. I uh, worked with uh, Kingdom Hearts, Mortal Kombat, Tony Hawk, all that fun stuff. And I'm just generally here to support and be part of CT Spectrum. Um, I'm based in Chicago. So if anyone else is from the Chicago or Midwest area, hello, enjoy the cold or the weird warm trend we have right now. And um, let's kind of get started moving forward. So today's schedule, we're going to identify who we are. We're going to talk to you about panelist introductions. Um, then we'll talk about game programming versus game design. We're going to talk about what we teach, game development courses and job opportunities. We'll do a game development pipeline simulation video, and then we're going to have a little short Q&A specifically towards that afterwards. We'll take a break, a little intermission, stretch your legs like we talked about. And then after that, we'll talk to admissions and they'll kind of talk about what they do and how they can help. Um, we'll talk about what makes this unique from our career development manager. We'll talk about the student experience from our TAs and alumni. And then we'll wrap up with next steps, resources, free resources, and we're gonna do a Q&A that we can kind of just get to know each other better. Um, beyond that, kick it off to Brenda, who is our course advisor with CD Spectrum. Brenda? Hi, thank you, Justin. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brenda Grahalis, and I am one of the course advisors here at CG Spectrum. I'm excited to, see, to be here with you today to help encourage anyone interested in pursuing an exciting career in game development. We've had many inquiries recently for our courses, and I'm so happy to see so many of you joining. I will be replying to questions in the Q&A section as we go along related to the admissions and application process, the different courses that we offer, logistical questions regarding enrollment deadlines, and payment options available. My colleagues Elena Yan and myself are always available also to schedule a Zoom meeting with potential students to discuss any questions or concerns. And finally, feel free to send us an email directly if there's anything we can answer for you. The email address is admissions at cgspectrum.com. I hope you find today's info session really helpful and send in those questions. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, Thanks. it's gonna be fun. Uh, I'm excited to see what we can, uh, how everyone actually enjoys it. Uh, so a little bit about CG Spectrum timeline wise, it started in 2011 by Nick and Jeff. They're industry veterans that wanted to find a better way to prepare game and uh, game artists and film artists for studio life. Uh, in 2017, we became a Houdini certified school. In 2019, we became a rookie certified school. In 2021, last year, we became an unofficial, uh, not unofficial, an official Unreal Academic Partner and an Unreal Authorized Training Center, which is huge. Uh, and 2021, we also broke into the top 50 um, creative media arts schools in the world from the rookies. And today, uh, we are a world-class international training school, and graduates are sought after for their technical skills and job readiness. So our graduates are some of the top studios. This is just a fraction of the studios that they're working at, but 343, Blizzard, anyone that's a big fan of anything that DreamWorks or EA does, Insomniac, Method, Industrial Light and Magic for you Star Wars fans, Epic Games, my job, uh, Riot Games, Sony Pictures, Ubisoft, Weta, MPC, Boomer, there's so many. Um, and it's very, very exciting to see that when you know, we have students rolling through and landing jobs at studios like this. It's, it makes us really proud as mentors in the school. So the benefits of studying at CG Spectrum, um, and the, one of the main reasons why I enjoy working here and actually came here from uh, other teaching places, it's 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 a personalized focused uh, career support for uh, for more like uh, specific jobs. It's flexible class scheduling and payment plans. We get live weekly QA calls with your mentor, and everything's recorded, so you can actually watch it back if you have questions. Um, you have access to industry insights and networking opportunities. You know, we're really big on not just having access to people uh, uh, for that one hour se uh, session with your mentor. You get access to like the whole staff, basically. 100% uh, online study from anywhere, which is amazing. Because um, if you're anything like me, you have spurts of creativity and maybe you have a full-time job or maybe you're just in a time zone that you think I can't access certain people, but you can. Um, Hands-on education mentorship from industry pros, which is a huge thing because you're getting hands-on one-on-one meetings and small classroom settings, private one-on-one -on -one or small groups with max of four, where you can actually talk to people like myself and some of the amazing mentors that you're going to meet today. And they're telling you literally what they do on a daily basis. And for an industry that is pivoting all the time and it is so fast-paced, you're going to need that kind of um, ability to talk to those people directly. 
Um, it's inspiring supportive community and industry experts and peers, you know, seeing how people actually help each other using tools like Slack and whatnot to critique and just be like make yourself feel welcomed. You wouldn't expect that from remote learning, but I feel more welcomed uh, in this remote world than sometimes I did in an actual studio setting. So it's it's fun. Um, it's very, very rewarding. Um, some of our mentors you get direct access to, there's a bunch. So they're carefully vetted professionals who have worked at major studios. So we're making sure that we don't just bring anyone on. Um, they've earned awards or accolades and working on your favorite feature films and AAA games. They're well-established, well-connected, and incredibly talented. They're based all over the world and they're covering most time zones. So that's a huge one for us being remote. Um, your mentor is going to support you with live weekly calls, recorded video critiques and assignments, and valuable industry insights and real world experience. But most of all, I can say without a doubt, all of our mentors actually, they really care. And we get excited when we see students that um, actually really want to be here. And we are very invested in your success and just, you know, how happy you are with your experience. Um, it kind of reminds us, you know, me, myself being a mentor, when I talk to some of these students, it reminds me of why I initially started doing this stuff. So um, it's it's a great relationship. So I'm going to bring it over to Alex, who is the department head of foundations and a swell fella. So Alex, you want to talk to him about what you do for foundations? Hello. Hi. Um, I'll, I'll make a quick intro. Um, I am a, a full-time foundations mentor and animator. Um, I've gone through the ranks. I have um, 13 years of career experience as a um, as a um, supervisor as a or not supervisor but lead as animator as a supervisor all of those roles um, throughout my career as um, in various companies throughout Vancouver um, I um, I generally know the importance um, for um, students to get what they need during the course so um, as a supervisor I was very often trying to encourage people at the workplace to, you know, deliver and um, get the spirits high, that's, that kind of thing. So um, I think all of those training functions throughout my career enables me to be um, a very good mentor, a very good um, sympathetic mentor and able to converse with students day to day and become, yeah, make them better animators, better modelers. Um, which we do in foundations. It's a well-rounded program. So we, you know, we try to infuse all of the 3D aspects into, um, into your normal lives and, and hopefully make you guys really good, really good students, really good uh, career potential as well. Yeah, I think it's great that you, you know, you mentioned sympathizing with it, I think, because I think that's the one thing that um, is nice to know that we understand how most people are in their shoes trying to learn and build themselves in this, this industry. And as also, you worked on Puss in Boots, which is one of my favorite DreamWorks movies. It's hilarious. So that's, that's great. Fun. Uh, Alex, thank you. Yeah. And if you guys get a chance, uh, check out some of Alex's work and just check him out. Um, amazing artist and great teacher. Scott is our manager of game development. And Scott has been, we mean Scott have actually worked at some of the same studios, but uh, Scott, you wanna talk about what you bring to the table? Sure, thanks, um, Justin. Um, yeah, I'm Scott Bayless. I've uh, been in the game business now since 1987. So I think I'm probably the old guy in the room. I shipped my first game in 1988. It was a role-playing game based on Dungeons and Dragons. And honestly, after that, I never looked back. Um, I've done a lot of different jobs in this business. I've worked uh, as an engineer, I've worked as a game designer, I've worked as a producer. And I think that puts me in kind of an, a unique position in that I've seen a lot of the different things that, that have to get done well for a game to succeed. And that's why I'm working with CG Spectrum as the manager of, of game development, which gives me the opportunity to work both with the programming side and the game design side. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting role for, for a guy like me who has been around games so long and who loves what he does. I've done a number of, of titles you'd probably recognize. I worked on the, uh, the Bond series uh, for Electronic Arts. I also uh, ran Flight Simulator at Microsoft for many years. I was part of the launch team for Xbox. And uh, yeah, it, the, working with CG Spectrum has been a, uh, a really amazing experience for me because it's an opportunity for me a guy who has been very lucky and been able to work on a lot of great stuff in the business to, to give back 
and bring new talented smart people into the industry it's amazing and uh 007 ruined college for me in the best way <laughs> we would just play it on time right um very very cool i have a question for you what's one yeah. of your favorite games my favorite games one of your you favorite know, like, i don't want to put the pressure on okay. making every the most more now, dare I reveal my proclivities and say that Path of Exile is a, is a game I just can't stop playing? Oh, I got to yeah, play that one. I've heard that. I'd kind of kind playing. of a hardcore action RPG guy. Have been for a long time. Nice. Very cool. I mean, if your first thing was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, then yeah, the, yeah. the foundation's been laid. Um, Scott, thank you again, everyone. You can feel free to look up Scott. He's done some amazing stuff. Um, and we'll talk to him soon. Troy is the head of our game design and he has worked on many games that have um, taken up my supposed study time as well. Uh, Troy. Um, hi, I'm Troy. I've been in the game industry now for almost 30 years. Um, I've been kind of, a, again, kind of like Scott in a wide variety of roles. I started off in visual effects, um, very quickly moved into become kind of a game designer and um, then became a producer and an executive. And, you know, I've been in the industry now um, in kind of a wide variety of roles, both as independent developer companies and as a publisher and so i've seen kind of the whole cycle of how games are made from five person teams all the way through 500 person teams and so when i created this program it was really about like how do you really create great triple a games right and i had that experience of being that guy in the trenches and having designed stuff and having worked on you know and overseeing games like rainbow six and stuff like that that were huge you know massive projects um but also very high quality and, and great success um they've had and so i've been very fortunate to have a, a amazing career you know and and now have my own company um called blink moon games and i'm building you know some new, new very innovative games today so i'm still in the trenches i still work every day in game design you know and, and every aspect from the theoretical side of it all the way to the hands-on you know application of building things in unreal as well as um everything in between and so I really try to bring a very you know, natural, very hands-on aspect to everything. That's not just a bunch of theory and a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but a bunch of stuff you can really use in the course to really, you know, get a great job in games themselves. So that's me, you know, and, and you'll be, if you join the game design course, you'll be seeing a lot of me. I'm the, the teacher of the course as well. So um, I ramble on and on, you know, for, for hours every week to help teach you guys, you know, everything you're gonna need to know to be a game designer. So that's me. Amazing. Yeah. I, again, to this Rainbow Six ruined a lot of crunch time. <laughs> a lot of people's me. lives. <laughs> yeah. And in the best possible way. So what what's one of your favorite games you're playing lately? Um, Horizon Zero Dawn has been a just a, a great game. I'm looking forward to the sequel coming out on Friday. And um got good played, ratings. Yeah. yeah, I play The Witcher a lot. Witcher three was one of my favorites, but I mean, nothing beats, like I grew up in Ultima 7 was probably my favorite game growing up. That was kind of what inspired me to become a game designer, you know, but I've been a hardcore, I play a lot of strategy, role-playing games, Age of Empires, even though I worked on the Age of Empires franchise for a long time, it's still one of my go-to games. Age 2 is just like almost the perfect game, so I still yeah. play a lot of that. Amazing. So. Yeah, that's that's so, and I think that's another thing to kind of point out. Um, that's why I'm asking these questions just so the audience knows is it, we still geek out on what we do. We're not just teaching it, we're, we geek out on it all. So um, yeah, as you can see from behind me, I, I still play, I play board <laughs> games, I play games, you know, everything, you know, as a game designer, it's not even just about playing video games, right? You got to understand why is chess fun? Why is those things fun, right? Everything is really yeah. relevant as a game designer because it's really hard, whether you're playing pen and paper, old school RPGs, D&D, &D, to board games, the video games, it's all really, you know, critical skills as a game designer. Yep. Got to interpret the world around you. Thanks, yep. Troy. Yep. Thanks, uh, everybody. Next up is Fierce. So he's the head of game programming, something that will, I will never understand, but he's worked on some amazing projects and uh, yeah, go for it. Thanks. Uh, hey, so I'm Fierce. I am the head of uh, game programming and I've been game programming for 15 years officially, but even before that in like high school and college um, is what really grabbed my attention. So if I wasn't math or science, I was just making jokes in class. So this was the path that uh, was best for me, especially because I couldn't like draw or anything, but I really liked the creative aspect of, um, you know, game development. And um, yeah, I just, uh, outside of programming, I also coached and uh, lifeguarded and did a lot of things that were actually, um, to do with 
people's progression and growth. So I love like even in my role now where I mentor people at work um, and have a team, I like to see people get better at a craft. So uh, for me, um, programming wasn't like something that came naturally where, you know, you can just ace a test without even studying. I actually had to like put in work and I like to apply that to the things that I do where how I understood things and how I can present problems in which uh, maybe it seems difficult, but if you break it down, it's easier to understand. So uh, I still love solving problems uh, and programming to this day. And I'm currently at Splash Damage and uh, I'm loving my time at CG and I'm happy to meet you guys. So thanks, Justin, for the intro. Yeah, I mean, I got to ask you one question since all the time <laughs> yeah. you had at Ubisoft. Uh, what's your favorite Ubisoft franchise? I see you worked on almost all uh, of them. <laughs> Man, yeah, I'd probably take take Far Cry to be honest. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Like of the games that I worked on that I played afterwards, it was uh, Far Cry and Blacklist that I actually played to completion because you play one of the games like so much through development that you can't oh, yeah. like, see it all the way through. But uh, Blacklist and Far Cry three and four, I actually played all the way through after. Nice, very cool. Um, I love those games. Uh, thank you, Ferris. And Thanks. Simon is next. He's the department head of Real Time 3D. Simon. Hey, Justin. Thanks, hey, everybody. Okay, so um, yeah, my career kind of started in like 2005, and I got into uh, character animation. That was my kind of my go-to. That's my comfort zone. And then I kind of, as I was doing my character animation stuff, I got more technical, more technical. Got into doing facial rigging, facial stuff, and then scripts and max scripts and all kinds of stuff. So I really sort of uh, fell into love with this technical animation role, which uh, has kind of carried me forward. And I got to uh, get hired at uh, Rocksteady, which allowed me to work on Batman Arkham City, which turned out to be like this amazing game. And then uh, I worked on a little bit of Arkham Knight as well. And uh, I sort of took that technical experience and knowledge and started my own studio called Collectivision and started building up uh, you know, my own base for what I can do with all these uh, features and tools that are available. Um, and that parlayed really well into uh, mentoring with CG Spectrum. And uh, so we've kind of been mentoring with CG Spectrum since 2015 and watching the school grow and working with it and building it up, making it a strong, um, you know, very valuable tool to, to, uh, to teach students. And it's been really like fun to be part of because uh, not only are you surrounded by really talented people, but you're also uh, enjoying this experience with the students. So that's been uh, a lot of fun. So. That's pretty much now in the department head for uh, real time. So I'm really focusing on uh, virtual production and, and all this great new technology with Unreal 5 that's coming out. So having a lot of fun just trying to stay on top of all that. And again, you worked on, I feel like everyone that's in here has worked on stuff that I love, like Batman Arkham City. It was so, I remember just watching, just staring at the environments, but also like the, the gameplay animations and everything like that. It's just a rewarding game. So what, what, uh, what's one of your favorite games now that you're playing? Uh, actually, I was prepared for this question because you've been asking everybody. Um, <laughs> I should have thrown it up and said movie. Oh. Yeah, that I would have been all thrown up. Um, uh, so my favorite genre right now, because I have two kids, one's four and one's six, is like couch co-op. And I'm all about couch co-op. So I'm like searching everywhere for the best couch co-op game that I can get. And there's, uh, there's plenty of them. I mean, it has to be like three players so that I can play. But like there's yeah. all these Lego games that are excellent couch co-ops games, but then there's only two players. So we're looking for like what's a good three player game. So my library is just chock full of these games, just always searching for the next one. I don't know what my favorite one is, but man, it's just I'm always looking for another one, trying to see if, if we can get something that's even more catchy and awesome. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like bringing it back to how games were when I was growing up where you literally had a set on a couch with someone to play them with them. <laughs> not not exactly. with the Internet. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Simon um all right so we have this little slide here and uh, i want to take uh the time to have uh scott and theorist um kind of explain the difference between game design and game program because that's something that a lot of people get uh kind of misconstrued when they are trying to get into this industry and actually when they're even in the industry because i come from a game art side and there is a lot of overlap that sometimes i get confused on so I'm going to let them um, kind of show you and explain what that is, and I'll be a fly on the wall. So at least from my perspective, game design uh, has always kind of been about what should the game do? 
and that can be expressed in a lot of different ways. Uh, and it really, the, the key word is what? What should it look like? What should this character do when a certain thing happens? Uh, what, uh, what should it cost to buy this item? I mean, those are the kinds of questions that designers have to answer all the time. Programming has a lot more to do with how are we gonna actually make it work? And uh, that can express as physics or it can express as uh, AI for, for a character. A lot of different ways that, um, that programmers get involved in, in what happens in a, in a game. But at the end of the day, that's kind of the distinction. And if you look at what a game designer does on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a lot of what designers are doing is communicating about what should be a part of the game and what should happen in the game. Uh, so there's a lot of writing. There's a lot of defining of rules. There's a lot of uh, uh, defining logic for how certain things should work. Uh, and then also, uh, especially lately, a lot of designers are getting more involved directly in placing things in a game, designing levels, uh, creating interesting things for players to do and creating interesting problems. Uh, whereas on the game programming side, there's a lot more attention being paid to things like uh, the math of what's happening under the hood or how the data in the game is being handled. Uh, how best to make things work as, as crisply and efficiently as they can. So that's kind of my take on, on the distinction. But anyway, Ferris, please you know, jump in. And yeah, no, I, th I think uh, you nailed it. Like, I mean, every day um, programmers and designers work together. So uh, in the majority of scenarios in AAA, indie as well, you'll have uh, scrums and uh, you're gonna be a part of a team. It's no game comes out with people in isolated blocks. Otherwise it won't be cohesive and you'll immediately notice like, you know, this level doesn't fit this character, et cetera. So as Scott said, it's essentially design kind of has the idea of what is fun and what is the intent and purpose. Um, so programming, of course, like there's communication, so you can always object and like talk together to work things out, but programming is more so providing uh, tools through code. So uh, you'll see later on actually, but um, so the programmers will have to work with designers because it's not good if you were to create something that nobody else knows how to use, right? So a designer will ask for something and a programmer will actually have to write the code that makes that feature come to life. And that's where the two are constantly communicating. Whereas the low level stuff of, you know, bugs and uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, the math part where, you know, 3D math of let's get this character from point A to point B and we need to do uh, AI pathfinding or uh, we need to find out if there's any obstacles or collision checks, um, projectiles bouncing off um walls and things of that nature that's going to be on the programming side because design just expects that to work so the programmer's got to do it um and that's the essentially the relationship you, you kind of like are going to be interested as a programmer in organization of data grouping things together like saying oh the weapon needs accuracy blah 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 this is all just like a part of one class cool i can make that and you're going to also like the problem solving of you know, how do I get 20 AI on the screen? Like, how can I uh, make it efficient, optimized? So that's, again, on the programming side. So hopefully that helps some of you guys that are confused about the two. So uh, here, here's, here's a possible analogy that I can kind of throw at you. So yeah. uh, we've all built IKEA furniture. So <laughs> yeah. the designer is going to be one that says, I want a dresser. Uh, it's got to be roughly this shape and it's going to be used for someone to duck behind and all their fun stuff. Uh, and then art will go ahead and make it look the way it does, figure out the surface, the little details, and then we'll give those pieces to programming and they have to put together. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good analogy. Like a essentially- Pretty good metaphor. Yeah, the design, like, you know, the little IKEA booklet that comes out and it has like, okay, these are the pieces and they'll figure out like the best way to put this couch together. And the program will actually take like a block of wood and like actually, you know, carve it out to that spec and everything and design will be like, yeah, that's exactly it. So yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good analogy. Yeah. And we're all always, and there's always a frustrating part to it, but it's always enjoyable. So yeah, I mean, uh, and it is always good to like, especially um, I come from the art side. It's, it's always good to have, you know, no matter what you're doing, I think a big thing that Scott said was communication you know, it's, it's to be constant communication and problem solving yeah. on both sides and even the art and then management side. So once you bring those both into there, it's just, 
one of your biggest skills that you can bring into the game industry, visual effects, any of that is communication. So something right to think about. Thanks, guys. Um, so uh, let's talk about some educational offerings in the curriculum. So the introduction to game design course is a three month course. Um, each term is 12 weeks. And so the, the first term uh, is our intro term. And it's really there to introduce you to all of the concepts of game design. How do you write a design document? How do you understand that minute to minute gameplay? How do you understand the bigger pictures of gameplay? How do you kind of all put it together? It's a lot about learning how to communicate and communicate those ideas out to people and stuff like that. And so it's really building you the skills you need to work on a triple A AAA team that's going to work on really big games and stuff like that. And it's also going to start to introduce you to like the technical side, like how do you actually implement these things as a game designer and how do you build levels and systems and things like that. And so you'll get some introduction to the Unreal Engine and start to build some really simple test levels here. It really doesn't dive too deep. But it's to kind of give you an overview of you know the game system design and how do you you know make that thing fun minute to minute and then the level design of you know how do you actually build a level and assemble it all together and those are really two of the biggest jobs you're going to get as, a, as an entry level game design course and so we want to show you kind of what both of those worlds are so that you know later on you can then dive deeper and really learn how to do those things but you're going to get a basic kind of understanding of the whole industry and how game design in general works and so um, but even if you have some experience in game design, we still highly recommend taking this intro course. It might sound introductory, but the amount of information that I give you in it is very, very, very deep. Um, and every week you have, you know, three to five hours, probably a video lecture that you're going to watch. And then the course is really 20 hours long and you really, it, it, it's a minimum 20 hour commitment. And the people that don't do that really have trouble because there's so many assignments and so much stuff to learn. So this is a huge crash course to try to learn you know, on um, the Unreal Engine and learn game design in a very short period of time. So we're very excited, though, that it really does introduce um, a lot of the, the great um, core concepts you're going to need. So then once you um, finish the intro course, then we have three additional terms. And so those three terms, again, are 12 weeks each, and there's a two-week break in between each. So it's roughly a nine-month course. And in this, you dive much, much deeper. And so in the, the first term, um, of this course, you're really going to kind of get into the, the basic buildings of, you know, um, building prototypes and understanding much deeper, of like, okay, how do I really build an Unreal? Or how do I really make stuff now? How do I really design something on paper, take it from a bunch of words all the way through to how do I build something? And you're going to build something really small, but it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be nice. And you're going to get an understanding that whole process of how you're going to go. And then the next term, you're going to dive in even deeper and you get into building action games, you're going to build a, an action game or a shooter. Um, we like to try to focus on kind of mainstream genres where most of the games, you know, jobs are. And so you're going to really figure out like, how do I build something with missions and quests and, you know, build something that's really going to be exciting to play and a lot of fun. And you're going to go again from concept all the way through finished on, on something that's even a little bit bigger. And then the final term is all about multiplayer. It's about teaching you the core ideas of like what it's like to build you know a multiplayer game how's multiplayer different from single player you know and then ultimately you're going to build a multiplayer level and really understand the nuances multiplayer for a lot of designers seems like it's really easy but it's actually harder it's harder to get those nuances you know back and forth of getting people to play together and so the course is really going to take you all the way from single player design storytelling everything else needed all the way into multiplayer design and really you know set you up to get a job as either a system designer or as a level designer um, in a wide, um, wide range of different jobs and fields. But again, we're very focused on, you know, AAA PC console game development. Um, we really don't touch mobile or anything like that. This is really about, you know, how do you work in a big team and how do you build really good, solid AAA projects? And if you don't know AAA, that's our term for building really big, high budget games, um, you know, versus an indie game might be built with a small team of, you know, five or 10 or 20 people, a big AAA team or a big studio, a big project is, sometimes built with 50 to thousands of people. Um, so that's kind of the difference. So we're trying to teach you how to work at Ubisoft, the EA companies like that. And that's really what this course is about. This is not necessarily, you know, about building little small indie games by yourself. You know, that is, it is applicable, but this is really about how do you go work for a big company and be successful there. Very cool. Thank you, Troy. Um, next up, Ferris, would you like to talk to us about game programming? Yeah, so the game programming course starts off with the intro to game programming where you get the C++ foundation and uh, you're going to be 
mentored by industry professionals that have a lot of experience with C++. So it's great that you put in uh, the work and ask any questions that you have in your Q&A because they'll give you tips um, and uh, knowledge from experience, which is hard to find uh, anywhere outside of uh, actually being in the industry. So we take things that we've actually used throughout game development uh, and apply it in the course. And on top of that, we have um, little scenarios that of course are gonna be useful for Unreal, which is the next one. So after you do the C++ um, course, then we go to the next uh, slide. So that's gonna be the, the game programming course. So the reason that we do the C++ intro is because Unreal Engine uses C++ as a base. And rather than you try to learn two things at the same time, it's nice to come in with that C++ foundation so that you can actually put together really good quality uh, portfolio pieces. And here, uh, again, we are more concerned with uh, building something that you can be proud of and a real portfolio piece that shows your ability to complete tasks, problem solve, and really uh, specialize or focus on something that you like. So rather than just get an overall abstract view of um, you know, what Unreal is and make little modules that don't really fit together, we build the course to give you an understanding of Unreal as a whole, and then afterwards make a really complex game that has AI, networking, split screen, local multiplayer, um, and a lot more game features that are gonna be beneficial to you to understand how systems work together and how you can also work with design by making like design friendly um, code. So yeah, we really kind of apply things that um, are used in the industry in the course. And again, you have the mentor to ask questions and learn from. So it's a, a really good uh, combo, the content with the QA and the mentor. Very cool. Thanks for that. Um, I still have to learn how to program, but yeah, C++ <laughs> is the one to do. Uh, next up, Foundations of Games, Art, and Animation course. Simon. Oh, that's, that's me. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we're, so in Foundations, oh, yeah. uh, we learn the basic structures of how to create something in 3D. Right, so um, we use programs like Maya, uh, Substance Painter, and um, uh, well, Maya and Substance Painter are the main, main ones. But um, we we learn um, sort of it's the foundations of what we need either to learn game game development or go into real time productions or any other sphere of the three D industry as a whole. So what it gives students is the ability. To, um, to bridge the gap between, say, having no experience at all and um, actually becoming a really good student in either of those stemming careers, right, or stemming programs here at CT Spectrum. So what we focus on is just to develop the student's confidence. We develop their abilities, their proficiencies. Um, they just need all of those basic skills in order to branch off into anything that they'll be, you know, set out um, in the career world. So um, we do things like modeling, and, uh, and this is a 24-week uh, process, and there's um, a 12-week first term and then a 12-week second term, two weeks in, in between. And um, in the first term, we learn all of the principles, right? We learn principles of animation um, that goes, you know, how to make things more appealing in animation, how to make things jump, um, how to make things like be really flavorful, I guess. And in modeling, we learn all the basics like uh, topology. Um, we learn how to keep our meshes under control, have um, like good UV editing and all of those basic sort of functions that you need to know. Um, and then we, you know, in the second term, we, um, we sort of let the student have a little bit more, um, I guess, reign over what they get to create, but they, it is structured into assignments. 
Um, but then they have after the first term, I feel like students have a lot more to um, a lot more creativity to put into their works. So I see a lot of more embellishments in their works and, and stuff like that. So I kind of see them sort of pick up the pace at in term two and then they get set off into any particular direction here at CV Spectrum. So um, and mainly game development. Very cool. Thank you for that. Um, now we go to the summer. Sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, so, like, and this works really well with what uh, Alex was talking about because foundations connects directly into this introduction to real time, um, and it's it's important to realize that the foundations goes two different streams. You could go into a VFX stream or you can go into a game art stream, and so they're building assets that are game ready so that you can use them inside of Unreal. And so this course is the course that you allowed to bring in those assets into Unreal, learn how Unreal works, start from the beginning, working as like an artist, understanding the materials and the animations, importing, we get, um, and the way that this course is sort of delivered is a course for technical animators. So this is kind of like my zone of uh, expertise. And uh, we make sure that we talk about basic elements of rigging, joint placements, uh, retargeting, like all this skeletal skinning, rigging stuff gets covered inside of this term. And these are the fundamentals of how a lot of people need, things that people need to know when they get into any kind of game development is, uh, and the questions that we always get is people just don't understand how exactly they get their character to look correct. You can get assets off of a marketplace and then you have them, but how do you get them to go into your character? How do you get your character to do things in the game? So this term is really about learning how to use Unreal in a way that lets you, um, you know, empowers you to be able to do things that you want. For example, get these guys to fly around in your background. Um, so that's the uh, that's the essence of what introduction to real time goes into. It can go, it can parlay into game design or programming or wherever it needs to go. It can be an independent thing. Um, we even have students who sometimes who already come with a portfolio are able to get started in this term without having to take foundations. So we can, uh, you can ask sales about how to, you know, whether or not you can take this or not. But then it also parlays into a uh, virtual production term, which is our next slide here. Yeah. So with virtual production, we've got this new course that just started in September. And it's kind of like a separate path from what programming and game design is. It's like, it's more for film, but it's using Unreal and the real time engine. So we get into a high level uh, learning process of how to do world building and like making beautiful looking scenery. And it uses all the Unreal technology to be able to do this. And then we have another term. So that's our first term, which is world building. We have mentors like William Fauché who will like be your mentor and has created the content for us and has done an amazing job. And then you get into the second term, which is actually virtual production. And that's designed for people who wanna get into cinematography um, it's really for like how you talk about camera work and uh, building up your uh, sets and scenes, working with LED walls. We don't actually work with LED walls, but it talks about the theory. We bring in mentors who are very experienced and um, have experience in stage volumes and stuff. So you get lots of interesting information uh, about this new upcoming technology for virtual production, which is like evolving every day. And uh, there's always new information coming out about that. And then there's a third term, which is our portfolio term. And that allows you to work with uh, the different mentors. And what's interesting about this course is that each term is mentored by a different mentor. So we really wanna make sure that you are being taught by the person who's an expert in that field. So you can make sure that you get the most amount of your time for each of the terms. Very cool. It. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's still a, it's, it's nuts to think that, you know, starting from PlayStation 1, the difference that I saw between game engines and what you saw on like movie screens and TV, and now that it's just right on the same line. Um, it's very cool. And, 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 and from, as a creative, that's going to be really fun as a student to kind of see that you can pretty seamlessly bounce between uh, games or virtual production um, once you have exactly. those big skill sets. Yeah, all interactive. It's just, it's really interesting how they come back, come on. Yeah, um, and that you know that kind of ops, obviously the, this leads to job opportunities. And um, one of the biggest things that you'll be getting away from these uh, these courses and the mentorship is you know it's problem solving, visual problem solving, being able to communicate, understanding these key softwares, and just 
getting insight into the industry itself. So there's roles like game design, systems design, level design. Um, if you're going down that path, there's game programmer, AI, AI programmer, gameplay engineer. If you're going more towards the art side, you're going to be game artist, character, environment, asset, or technical artist, as well as animation. Um, and just to let you know, too, it, it's the this industry, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's, it's just growing and growing. It's getting stronger and stronger because there is this nostalgic passion towards, you know, video games that, you know, everyone wants to share. Um, you know, if you grew up playing Mario, you're going to want to show someone else that you play with the newest Mario. There's this uh, inherent trend of that. Um, and we see that kind of showing where, you know, look, look at the console sales and the mobile and the PC. Like, so games are not going anywhere. They're very strong. So hopefully that is a warm, fuzzy blanket around your shoulders when you're uh, debating whether you should dive into this opportunity. Um, we're gonna show you now a quick video on pipeline simulation. And then afterwards we'll do a little bit of a Q&A on that. So let's take a look at that right now. Games is incredibly hard, but really rewarding. New game ideas are either totally unique and original or might be based on a franchise or an existing game as a sequel. It can take several people to several thousand people, a few months to a few years to make a great game. The game team usually consists of a creative director, producers, game designers, artists, engineers, audio directors. People do so many different jobs when it comes to making a game and making it great. In the beginning, the team's gotta come up with a great idea. While that sounds easy, it's really hard to come up with just an amazing game that's new, unique, and original. Something that's gonna sell, something that's not you know too different or too weird or too strange, but something that people are gonna really gravitate towards and really wanna play. So that team has to start with an idea, has to start with a concept, has to work on that idea, work it out on paper, prototype it, you know, try to figure out what's special about it, right? Those can take a really long time, really, really just nail it, just get every little aspect of that game right you know, before they move on to really fully build the game in production. The vision for the game is usually held by the creative director. The creative director kind of comes up with all the original ideas with his team. But he's the one that guides and shepherds it, kind of like a movie director. He's the one that comes up and helps with the story and the visuals and all aspects of the game and why it's fun and how it all comes together before you go in and build it. You're gonna figure out how much it's gonna cost to build, how long it's gonna take. Can you even do it with the tools and the technology you have? The job of a creative director is really hard but really, really fun. And it's something that every game designer someday usually hopes to become. System designer is the person who puts together minute to minute gameplay. That starts with an on paper design, figuring out how you're gonna move and fight and all the little things you're gonna do every second of the game as you're playing it. Then they're gonna figure out how to implement that into your game engine, how to make that fun, how to make it balanced, and how to make it really rewarding. So the system designer is responsible for the minute to minute gameplay within a video game. Level designer is kind of part artist, part game designer, part engineer. There's somebody that has to put together the whole vision for where is the game gonna be? What's that world like? How's it all come together? And how's that fun? Where are the enemies at in the world? Where are the quests or the missions and all the things that you do? So they're really in charge of kind of that long-term, usually one area of a game, how it all comes together. They're using those systems that the system designer helps build and they're using it into a bigger context to figure out how is this all gonna come together? They gotta make it come together really great make it look good and play fun. Here's an example of how you work as a team to put together a whole new level. We're gonna take a level, we're gonna modify it, we're gonna come up with a new idea for how to make it better. And we're gonna pass it back and forth and back and forth many different times. This isn't just a one man, you know, coming up with something and implementing it. This is about a team working together and trying to figure out how to solve a problem. So Scott, over to you. Thanks, Troy. So what we're looking at here is actually a small science fiction action shooter project that we've been working on. And you'll see that from the outside, the space station doesn't really look like a space station at all. And that's because when you're playing, you never really see it from this perspective. You never see the outside of it at all. And so there's no particular reason for us to make it look like a space station. What we're going to look at here is the first encounter that the player is likely to have when they start the level. If we go through this door, this is the, the only door you can get through at the beginning of the level. We go through here, and this door is pretty much right in your face when you, when you come through. And if we step inside, you'll see, oh yeah, there's a bad guy here waiting for you. Uh, and one of the things we've been talking about is maybe amping this up a little bit because we want this first encounter to be something that really kind of shocks the player. So we've been talking about adding uh, at least one more enemy. So I'm gonna select this guy and I'm gonna drag him off 
and now we've got two bad guys. And in fact, you know what? We're going to go to three. We really want this to be kind of an intense moment. So now we've got three enemies here, and we're going to run the level and see how it goes. Okay, so here we are running the level, and oh, yeah, the first thing you're going to run into is a weapon. So we're going to pick that up. And you can see this is kind of a Star Wars looking block. Uh, so we're going to run over here. We're going to go through this door. And we're going to step into the... Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Okay, this might have been a bad idea. Oh, and I'm dead. Well, that didn't really go very well. But at the same time, we want this to be a pretty intense uh, moment. So instead of just dialing back the number of bad guys, I think what we're going to do is proceed on something we've been talking about for a while now. We're going to give you a little companion. And that companion is mainly to give you some early warning in the event that there's danger nearby. So Alex, uh, let's go ahead and move forward on, the, on that robot we talked about. Get it built and animated and we'll put it in the level and see how it how it plays thanks scott in foundations we structure the course in two parts animation and modeling both tracks teach the basic concepts and eventually these lead to more advanced areas like visual effects game design modeling animation and even virtual productions the foundations are an essential basis to any field within the production environment so Scott, building a companion robot is a great idea. This will surely enhance gameplay. Now let's start the process of modeling. So we need a game asset now. I'll be using Maya to create the geometry for this. This will be rigged and textured eventually too. We need something that follows the main player at an equal pace. So this gives us an idea about size. I'm thinking one quarter to one third scale, kind of like a dog. It needs to pick up and fly for additive firepower when the player needs it. It's a great time to discuss this with a concept team to get some ideas locked in, but in this expedited form, maybe I can just get straight into it. We can go down the rabbit hole of ideas now. Roombas, drones, drones with quad blade versus opposing blade designs, kind of like the Mars helicopter. Insects, scorpions, jumping spiders, battle bots. I can imagine anything here. I can pull references virtually anywhere to make something cool. It needs to be compact, agile. A fold-out function for the blades would be super neat. It'd be cool to have it jump and walk like a spider too. So mechanical functionality is a must. Wheels or tracks would only make it heavy. We can think a little like an engineer without the pressure of being one. Once we lock in a design, I can send this around the floor to motivate the crew. It's nice to have everyone on board with the idea. Now to give Simon the head start, I'll provide him with proxy geometry. Uh, this is sort of like dummy geometry. So he has the proportions and sizes needed to complete the rig and animation. While he's working on that, I will build the final model, including all knuckles, hydraulics, and pivots that I can imagine would mechanically function properly in real life. Paying attention to the robot's kinematics is essential. Thanks, Alex. So for intro to real time, we talk about animation and rigging in a game engine environment and it applies to our game development production cycle. And in this case, while Alex is working on producing the final model for our character, we have built a proxy model that we use to help uh, visualize what our character is going to look like and what we're going to do with it. So with this mesh, we would assign some joints to it and prepare it for being able to animate with and then skin them. And not really worrying too much about the quality, just giving us something to start with so that we can visualize things. So once Alex is finished with the final model, we would bring it into the scene as a rigger and uh, compare the differences between the two meshes. We would check for making sure that the geometry is prepared in a way that's ideal for rigging and send any fixes back that's necessary. Uh, and then we would create a new set of joints, apply it as best we can to the new mesh and check for any issues when we're trying to do our skinning to uh, apply a good quality pass for our final mesh so that when things deform, we check to make sure it's gonna act properly. Otherwise we send those fixes back to the modelers to correct. 
So once we're kind of uh, happy with this, we put it into the Unreal Engine again, apply a more final rig to it using some of the feedback we've gotten from the pre proxy uh, skeleton and the animation. So you can see here we built a few animations, uh, learning some mistakes from the past and applying some of the new features we have with this new updated mesh to see how things are going here. We've built a animation blueprint that's allowed us to see some random sequences so we can just play it in the level and see how the animations blend from one to the next in a you know fairly realistic uh, representation of what the game would be like. So once we've done some of these tests, we can pass these final assets over to Fierce so that he can begin uh, implementing them and putting them in the game. Hi, I'm Fierce Hassan the department head for the game programming course here at CG Spectrum. Whether you're on a large team or a small team, you're essentially going to be working in an IDE. On the screen here, you can see this is Visual Studio. There's also plenty other options. The important thing is that you have access to the source code. Generally, only the programmers or the software developers have access to the source code and can make modifications to existing tools or create new tools for animators, designers, modelers to work with to bring the game to life. In this example, Simon has put together an animation and Scott has asked for a feature. We're going to bring this to life by taking that animation, plugging it in, and then giving Scott the tools to be able to tune it and make it work the way that he wants. So the request was to get this character that follows us around to be able to take a higher vantage point when combat starts. So here I've actually mapped the perception of gunshots as a threat. And you can see when I fire, there it is. The AI takes a higher vantage point and can now, if there were enemies shooting at them, could be firing back and as other feature requests come in, we can tackle those as well. While I work within the Unreal Engine, the main tunable parameters we provide are done through code. Here you can see the flight component was added in that a few variables were exposed, so that way the speed and the height could be tuned by design. Here you can see in the AI controller, there are new variables that are tied to the flight component that can be tuned to adjust the behavior. And so essentially that's the relationship. A feature request may come in, and this is for AI and gameplay. There's also tools and engine programmers working together on a pipeline that allows the entire team to make a game shippable. Programmers are responsible for the low level work in the IDE, problem solving, figuring out what the needs the rest of the team are and writing the specific code. In our case, we use C++, you could use C Sharp, Python, the language isn't that important. What's important is the outcome. We teach C++ because that's the industry standard and we use Unreal Engine. Okay, thanks Ferris. So here we are back in the project. We now have our little buddy here and Ferris tells me that the way this little guy works is that he will pop into flight mode when uh, I fire my weapon and try to help defend me. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick this thing up and we're going to run over here. Let's see if he follows me. Oh yeah, here we go. Yep, he knows how to follow me. We have a little problem with bad guys in that room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire my weapon and see if he'll go into flight mode and then uh, we'll see how things work out. So let's, let's fire that. Oh, there he goes. Outstanding. Okay, so now he's in flight mode and he'll help defend me if uh, I go in there and get in the fight. So let's give that a try. And we win. Outstanding. There we have it. All this example gave you a better idea about what a game designer is, what a game programmer is, and a game artist, and all the different disciplines in a game and it might give you an idea for where you might want to be and see for yourself what it's like to be a game designer because it's an amazing job and I know you're going to love it. Take care now. So that was awesome. Um, really loved watching that video. Yeah, that was fun to see. I mean, I, I think that's uh, for everyone watching it. It's very hard sometimes to showcase like a, a, a real time 
situation where you know someone like Scott would have a design problem and come up with a possible solution to pass it off to you know modeling animation while it's getting rigged up and then getting programmed. It's that's the typical like life of a game dev. You're uh, that's why communication and problem solving skills are so important, yeah. and that's another thing that we're going to be teaching you um, all as well. Yeah, do um, that you know two thousand times, and you've got yourself a game. <laughs> so we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, one of the next things we're going to talk about is admissions. So hopefully at this point, you're, you're getting excited about uh, CG Spectrum, who we are, um, our mentors, our process, the courses you can take. And if that is something that truly excites you, admissions, uh, you can go to cgspectrum.com slash apply dash now. Um, we have an admissions team that usually in touch within two or three days after your enrollment is confirmed. You'll be matched with industry mentor, receive your weekly Q&A call time. And you'll get access to the student portal and a private CT Spectrum community. So the, the, another thing to remind from, remember is that we're very flexible. We will try to work with you and your schedule as well. So um, um, it's not a traditional school where you're given set times. We work with you on what times work for you. So prior software experience. So introduction and foundation courses, you have no experience required. Advanced courses, intermediate knowledge of uh, software is required. And then the software you'll be learning is included with the cost of your tuition. Specific uh, prerequisites for each course on individual course pages um, at CT Spectrum are shown. And if you have any questions, just hit us up at hello at ctspectrum.com. And something also that I'll throw in there is that when deciding to apply, um, and you've heard some of our mentors actually mention it, uh, you're, there's a time requirement. Um, and the more time that you put into something, the more time you, uh, the, the better you get at it. It's just practice. So, you know, if you decide to go down this um, this path, just know that you know the, the more serious you are about it, the more time you put on it, the, the better your results are going to be. Um, and then let's talk about how it works. So let's play another video. If you're looking to turn your creative passion for film and games into a successful career as a digital artist in the entertainment industry, choosing the right school can be a challenging decision. But imagine if you had access to industry mentors who have worked on blockbuster films and best-selling video games supporting you every step of the way. When you enroll at CG Spectrum, you'll be connected to the most talented artists around the world who are excited to share their years of knowledge, ensuring that you are highly trained, well-connected, and prepared for your new career. Here's how it works. At the start of each week, you'll log into your learning management system where you review lesson requirements, watch your video lectures, and get started creating the first pass of your assignment. Next, you'll upload your files and meet with your mentor for a live midweek Q&A session to review your work, problem solve issues, and discuss any questions you might have. Mentors work within your file solving problems in real time, demonstrating their professional workflow to ensure that you don't make the same mistake twice. After the live Q&A session, you'll have until the end of the week to address your mentor's notes and submit another pass for a final video critique, ensuring that your work is portfolio ready. During your time at CG Spectrum, you'll have access to a curriculum designed by industry leading artists, custom created video content and supportive materials, as well as free educational software, access to our student learning portal and online community where you'll get feedback on your work and grow your professional network. By the end of the course, you'll have learned the skills necessary to produce a polished professional portfolio and have the confidence in knowing that you have what it takes to succeed as an artist in the film and game industry. So if you're interested in becoming part of the next generation of production-ready artists and joining alumni at major studios all over the world, let us help you find your pathway to success. To be the best, learn from the best at CG Spectrum. Uh, so hopefully that helped with you understanding how it works. Again, I am a huge fan um, of how everything is with the mentors, the ability for myself, to, uh, as I'm sure is with the other mentors, to actually not just help solve problems, but actually get to know the students as well, um, really helps us understand how to help you grow, um, finding out what passions you have, you know, like what things you have obstacle wise, it, it really helps. And with a traditional kind of environment of education, where sometimes you're in classes that have 20 or 30 people, it's set times, you don't really get that hands-on help that um, you really can use to thrive. So the next one would be 
introducing Maxine, our career development manager. And Maxine, hey, Justin. thank you. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about career stuff. Thanks. Are you not going to ask me what my favorite game is? I'm going to ask you what your favorite movie is because you have a loads of them that you've worked on. Oh my God. I <laughs> Well, my favorite movie that I worked on or my favorite movie ever. Oh, let's do, let's do the worked on one. Okay. I mean, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I, um, my mom was a Star Wars fan. And so she got me into it at a very young age. And so when I got to work on um, the, the newest trilogy, that was like a big personal moment for me. Um, and I think that's also when my, my mom and my parents like really took me seriously with my career path. <laughs> They're super excited for something. They're like, oh yeah. 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 They're like, are you sure you don't want to go like to, you know, a more traditional university, learn about like business management or something like they, they were like, are you sure this is the way? And I was like, no, VFX, VFX is what I want. Um, and, and that was really that turning point for me that, that made me feel like it kind of validated my whole, um, all the work that I had put into it. And, um, this, you know, crazy career path that not everyone believed in. Um, so, so getting to work on that for me was, um, was really special. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. And my favorite game lately, I've been playing it for a while. It's like a mobile game. I haven't had time to play PC games lately. It's um, not Wordle, is Holly, it? Yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say Wordle, but no, there's another one that I love that I keep going back to. It's called Polytopia. And it is so much fun. It's like a strategy game. It's similar to like, um, you know, Risk or something like that, but it's like made for mobile and it's super cute. And there's like all these cool characters. Anyway, um, I'm not affiliated. I just love that game. I've been playing it for years now. Um, Awesome. So let me tell you all a little bit more about myself. So as Justin said, my name is Maxine Schnepf and I am the career development manager here at CG Spectrum. So I have seen a couple of questions asking about how we help people um, and, and about portfolios and how we get people career ready. And that is basically my job here. And so I help students stand out and break into the film and games industry. Um, my background is primarily in visual effects and uh, for film and TV. Although I've also worked in advertising and I'm learning so much from people like Justin, Scott, Troy, Simon, and all of our mentors here uh, to, that are teaching me more about the, the game development um, process and pipeline and what that industry is like. So I'm learning a lot here, um, but I do find that there are a lot of similarities. And at the end of the day, it really is so important to have a solid portfolio. It doesn't matter what field you're thinking of getting into, it's all about that portfolio. So I am here to help students develop a good one, work with their mentors to create projects that reflect not just their abilities, but also the types of studios or jobs that they want to get into. Um, because what works for one student might not work for, for another one. And so that's been a really big challenge with um, my job here is, you know, we have students coming from all over the world. They're not just from the US or, or Canada like me. So even though I have a, a strong network here in Canada, I'm always looking to expand that worldwide and help students figure out how they can get a job where they live and, you know, find opportunities closer to home. Um, and so a little bit more about my background. Um, some of the studios I worked for are Technicolor, Mr. X. I worked for Deluxe Animation as well. Um, and some smaller boutique studios before that doing commercials, music videos and stuff like that. And yeah, you can see some of the movies that I've worked on. These are some of the most impressive ones. Blade Runner 2049, War of the Planet of the Apes, Spider-Man Homecoming, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, but I've also worked, you know, I'm Canadian. I'm from Toronto, Canada, and I've worked on a lot of Canadian content too. So I've done some TV shows, some Netflix TV shows. Um, I've done some Hallmark movies. Anyone out there like those Hallmark Christmas movies? <laughs> Probably not, uh, but okay. someone has to work on them. <laughs> so I've done some of those too, um, and some some lesser known titles. Um, and so yeah, I really I really love this industry, and I'm super happy to to be part of it. And now give back to the students. And my whole mantra here at CG Spectrum is to teach people what I wish I knew when I started. Um, I feel like I didn't get the support that I. Um, thought I was going to get when when I went to college and you know maybe at the time I, I wasn't as open to, to feedback either so that's something I had to learn 
Um, and so that, that's really been my focus is to help people figure things out and, and teach them some things about the industry so they're prepared for it before they get in and not uh, scramble when, when they're you know, already trying to get a job. Um, and thank you, Jessica, Hallmark movies, Hallmark Christmas movies are the best. <laughs> they are. <laughs> if you like trash movies, check them out. Um, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes us unique. So I love the CG Spectrum community. It is amazing. We have this awesome Slack community. So we use Slack. It's kind of like a, an online messaging server. It's similar to Discord, if you're familiar with Discord. And so we use Slack to not just communicate with your mentor, but we also use it to do things like sharing information about jobs. We share information about internships, contests. We even have internal contests that our TAs run. So we have some technical assistants here that you're going to meet shortly. Um, and they run a whole bunch of internal events and contests through the school and little uh, prompts to help you figure out ways to not just do your, your assignments and your coursework, but to also take what you've learned and create something new with it. And so it's really fun. Uh, we have a lot of information in our Slack channels. Uh, we also host live events. So I have some events every once in a while about career opportunities. I've hosted some amazing studios recently in the past few months, like ILM. So we're talking Star Wars. We had a nice Star Wars um, presentation from ILM recently to talk about their internship opportunities that are coming up. Um, I've also hosted Epic Games twice now. Uh, they're always super fun and we talk about internships and what they look for in uh, you know, junior graduates. And these are exclusive for CG Spectrum students only. So we do have a lot of public webinars, kind of like this one right now. Um, and we have some other videos that are public on our YouTube page. So check out our YouTube page. I'm pointing as if I'm on YouTube, like, like and subscribe. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we do have a lot of public content, which is I'm sure why some of you are here because you've already found us online, but it gets even better when you're a student in our community um, because we host a lot of student only events as well. Um, we also have job boards on Slack. And so those get updated every single day. We have jobs for every single field that we teach that we're posting daily in our Slack community. Um, and one of the things that I love the most is the ability to share work and your ideas and maybe your work in progress on your assignment, or maybe some personal projects, you can share them with other students on Slack. And this is, in my opinion, one of the most valuable things about CG Spectrum is because it's not just about doing your assignment um, once, you know, and just getting it over with. It's about constantly getting feedback, not just from your mentor, but from your peers, you know, crowdsource that feedback, crowdsource your, um, your experience and get the opinion from other people. That's what major game studios do. They get not just one, you know, QA test, they have multiple people testing it all the time. Sometimes they get external companies to test their games um, and give them feedback. And so we try to mimic that environment here at CG Spectrum uh, by giving you the ability to talk to other people about your work. And so you're not just in your own bubble alone. So I think that is super, super special. Last but not least, I was going to say our relationships um, and partnerships with external studios and organizations. So, you know, just like we know Justin here, Justin works at Epic Games and he also works at ArtStation. And so we love working with our mentors who are in our Slack community uh, to get exclusive events for students job opportunities, you know, insight and information from these people. We also run um, open sessions as well for our students within our Slack community. So they're basically even more events where you can talk to mentors who work in the industry um, and learn more about, you know, what they do and, and what that's all about. Hit it, Justin. I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes. Okay. Next is your mentor. So how can your mentor help you? Um, these are a couple of things that you can work on with your mentor. So they are great for some specific creative and technical guidance. So not just on your weekly assignments, but also some personal projects. If you need some help with something, or if you see maybe a cool tutorial, or maybe you see uh, a really cool effect that someone made, 
on someone else's demo reel or maybe in in some game that you've played and you're wondering like oh i wonder how they made that um you don't have to wonder you can talk to your mentor and they can point you in the direction of some good resources or they can show you how something like that was made and and explain it a little bit better to you so it's great um if you if you're looking for some creative or technical help you have your mentor to go to each week um, to give you that support. Um, another thing your mentor can help with is portfolio and project critique, um, specifically for more technical or creative perspective. So um, I'll talk in the next slide about like things that I can help with, but specifically with your mentor, they can give you some more specific notes about technical things that you can upgrade, you know, creative things that you can adjust to make sure things are looking good. So you're not just getting um, feedback from one person, um, but this is what your mentor will specialize in. And then finally, you also have the ability to ask relevant questions about your career path and work experience with your mentor. So, you know, again, you don't have to keep it just to your weekly assignments and those specific topics each week. If you have some extra time during your Q&A session, you can ask your mentor things like, hey, you know, like what was your first job in the industry? You know, what was that like? Like, how did you get your first role? Or what's, what's a good entry level um, thing that I could, you know, job that I could consider? Um, so you don't have to keep it strictly to the assignments. You can talk to your mentor about other things and really get a more personalized experience. And that really is what makes um, CG Spectrum so special in my opinion. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about me and some more things that I can offer you. Before you do that, I wanted to kind of just echo uh, two oh, of the yeah. things you're talking about. So things like the specific creative and technical guidance, those of you are listening, that means that you should be researching the industry as well. Like, you know, we're encouraging you to watch TV, watch movies, play games, but also understand the companies and the people working behind it. So you do have those questions to ask. And then when you're thinking about talking to mentors like myself or Simon or Scott or whoever it might be, you always want to think about that, you know, we're potential people that would be your manager or your lead or your supervisor. So if you get comfortable asking us questions, it's not even just about possibly the career, but just about ourselves. And you, it's about maintaining a relationship and getting better at communication. And you'll find that when you get ready to have your interviews, you have less kind of anxiety because you've been so used to talking to people who are in the industry and you know that mm -hmm. we're not that scary. So yeah. I mean, most of us aren't that scary. Ah. <laughs> so some of us, and, and, but, but that's another thing too, to keep in mind about your mentors. And I talk about this to students in our new student orientation, actually, that I host um, every month for new students. Um, but one thing you really have to remember as a student is to advocate for yourself and, and not be afraid to talk to your mentor. I know sometimes it could be a little bit, um, you know, some people are shy and, and it can be so cool to, to be in this you know, class with this amazing mentor, like, you know, for us or Justin, like people that have worked on these awesome games. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not here to help you. So don't be afraid to ask questions. They're here. Their time is here just for you. Um, and so that's what they're there for. Um, but yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, on now to what I can help you with. So this should answer some of the questions that I've seen, but I'm happy to go into more detail at the end during our Q&A. And so um, these are some of the things that I can help you with, some additional resources that I'm responsible for. So I can offer one-on-one -on -one career guidance sessions. So I meet with students one-on-one -on -one in a Zoom thing, kind of like this, except way less people. Um, and we talk about you know, different things. So what works for one student doesn't always work for another. So I really like to get to know people and give them a personalized experience. We talk about where you're from. I saw a bunch of questions here about what students can expect if they live in remote countries, for example. So those are very common questions um, and issues that I talk to students about because we have students all over the world. So that is a very common thing that I chat to them about. And it's something that we can talk about if you join our school. Um, another thing that I do is portfolio and demo reel reviews. So again, remembering to what I said in the previous slide, the more specific technical and creative questions are for your mentor, but what I can help with is to make sure that you're presenting your portfolio well, or that you know you have all of the right information in your demo reel and your portfolio, and that you have a solid, um, you know, 
consistent uh, level of quality that you're trying to present. So I sort of look at things from more of a recruiter standpoint, whereas your mentor can look uh, at your portfolio or your demo reel from more of a creative or technical standpoint. So it's, it's definitely a, um, you know, a targeted approach from, from different angles. So you're not just going to get one review and that's it. A lot of traditional schools just give you like one portfolio review the very end and then they kick you out. Um, I like to look at this stuff over time and, and guide people as they get through their course. So typically I talk to people around, um, you know, as they're entering the third term or, or during their second term in the advanced courses. Um, but I can also talk to people earlier. So I've met with some students who are in the foundations course to help them figure out, you know, what to do next and, you know, what they're best at and try to, you know, figure out what, um, what direction they should go into. Um, I also help with resume assistance so I can review your resume for you and give you some tips. I haven't seen one resume that was absolutely perfect. I'm very picky with this stuff. So even the best ones, there's always something I like to move around to make sure that you're presenting yourself in the best way. Because at the end of the day, you don't want a resume or a CV to be preventing you from getting these jobs. You should leave it up to your portfolio and let them judge your portfolio. But it, you, know, you don't wanna have any mistakes in your resume and you wanna present yourself in the best possible way. Um, another thing I do is interview preparation. So if you get to the point where someone has finally called you back to get an interview, I can host what's uh, called a mock interview with you. So I did one last week for a student and I do them, or actually I did two last week uh, for two different students. Um, they're a lot of fun um, and it really helps you you know, put your best foot forward for your actual interview. So you're less nervous because you've had this like fake interview with me first. I ask you a bunch of questions and that really helps to put students at ease and feel a lot more confident for their actual interview. It's so cool. Um, and I love doing it because I get to be like a little actor for a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, another thing I help with, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I host some career focused workshops and webinars. Um, I also talk to students and work with them to organize recruitment info events. Um, there's also a jobs board and I um, send out careers newsletters sometimes. And I even send out like targeted emails to certain students in certain fields, depending on some job opportunities that come to us. And last but not least, I'm also collecting portfolios. So I have a little portfolio database um, that I share with potential employers. And so I share different student portfolios, depending on what type of you know, positions, different studios or clients are looking to fill. And so I can give targeted recommendations uh, to some potential employers. I love doing that. And I love seeing it when people um, or students get matched up with uh, different jobs and different companies. So it's always really special when I get that message from a student saying, oh my God, Maxine, I got an interview or, oh my God, Maxine, I, I got the job. Like I got an offer. Um, that makes my day. Um, I love it so much. So I can't wait to do that for all of you watching and help you find your career in games or film. Thank you for all of that information. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. There's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> it's needed too. Like for those of you who are uh, um, coming on board that um, may not know exactly what you want to do, that is the time to initially talk right away to even introduce yourself and identify, you know, because I think that's, you know, I, I'd like to think about there's two types of people who mostly go to these types of schools and it's someone that doesn't know what they want to do. You know, they approach mm -hmm. schools buffet line and they, they're going to try one of everything. And then there's someone who's been in the buffet line and they know exactly what they want to do. And so, you know, either or it's, it's a great spot to be in because you, you have a general idea and then you have a razor sharp idea. So if you talk with someone like Maxine, um, they're going to help you kind of refine your, your end goal target. And, and keep in mind, when you're trying to get a, your initial job, it's not your end all be all. We're not expecting you to put this pressure of like, this is the only studio and only uh, skill set I ever want to focus on. No, you mm -hmm. can move around like we all have. So yep. it's just about getting your foot in the door. And it's much easier to do when you have a, a studio, a subject matter, a specific skill, like all in, all in focus. Yeah, yeah, super, super important. And, and yeah, I, I think um, 
just seeing here what, what some people are saying in, in the chat, you know, people are asking about career switches and things like that. I think we'll answer some of those questions in more detail at the end, but, yeah. um, but it's a very common question. And like Justin just said it now, a lot of our mentors have pivoted. Like I went to school for more creative things and I ended up being, um, you know, a producer and a manager um, and I manage artists instead of actually doing the art myself. Sometimes you realize things about yourself as you move on and that's totally okay. There's no, there's not like a straight line in a career path. It's all about figuring out what's right for you. And that's why I love this job because every student is like a little puzzle. I get to figure out like what's right for them and what their interests are and what their skills are, what they're best at what they're not so good at. And we try and um, figure out a plan, you know, to make sure that they feel supported and they feel confident in their path. I, I can't express enough um, how happy it makes me when I see a really nervous face in my Zoom room when I meet with them for the first time. And they're like, oh my God, what am I gonna do with my life? And by the end, we're, we're smiling, we're laughing, we have a plan. I usually give them some homework and some action items to, to focus on when they leave. and. Um, and another thing is that it's not like a one time only sort of thing. So I've met with some students who went to other schools in the past and they're like, oh, do I have to like pay for this counseling or, you know, can I meet you again? Is that allowed? Like, yes, absolutely. I've met with some students multiple times. I also talked to some students who already graduated. So I'm still in contact with people who graduated over a year ago. They're still giving me job updates about their career. Um, sometimes people even ask me like, oh, they already have a job and they're talking to me about, hey, what should I do next? I'm thinking of getting a promotion or I'm thinking of moving to this other studio now. And, and so I'm still there to support them. Uh, I love hearing from our alumni. It's so much fun. Uh, but speaking of students, and, and alumni, we want to introduce you to our technical assistants. We have two of them here and they're gonna tell you all about what they do. Alexios, Jeff, nice to have you. Welcome to our open day. So nice to do this with you, you two right now. Hey everyone. Tell us about what you do. So guess I'll start. My name is Alexios and I've, been with CD Spectrum in the game design course for quite a few months. I always loved uh, breaking down games, deconstructing them, hence my goal to become a systems designer, specifically in RPGs. I've had some experience with designing stuff, like a couple of small projects and uh, some escape rooms here in Greece. And I've also played as a professional League of Legends player for some years, which kind of pushed me into this general direction. Um, Jeff, one, two. Yeah, with him. thanks. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jeff Geron. Uh, I am the game programming TA here at CG Spectrum. Uh, you know, even though I uh, just recently graduated as a student in the programming department, I've actually been in the industry for well over a decade at this point. Uh, I got my start uh, in QA testing at Gearbox Software. Uh, I've worked on games like Duke Nukem Forever, Borderlands 2, Aliens, Colonial Marines, and the VR ports for Skyrim and Fallout 4. Uh, and I also decided in 2019 to kind of brand myself um, and, and create an LLC, uh, which I called Little Grim Entertainment, um, to which I have uh, uh, recently started creating my own content uh, uh, and my own games with uh, even people here from CG Spectrum. Uh, Alexios is actually one of the game designers on one of my teams. So uh, yeah, I'll kick it back to him. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, student experience here at CG Spectrum. So a typical week as a student in CG Spectrum involves watching several videos about the course you're taking, reading through a lot of material that the school offers and working on your assignments and personal projects, of course. Your mentor is always there to help you through that, answer your questions, help you work out some issues you might face either in your assignments or your personal projects as well. But it's also the TAs that are there to answer questions and help you with either messages, meetings, stuff like that. And there is a huge community that you can share your work with. You can talk about random stuff. You can ask or provide feedback. And the most important thing for me is connect 
our jobs are all about connections and learning to work with other people in other departments. So this is the best environment to actually practice that skill and learn how to connect with people. Um, as for opportunities, there are a lot of workshops or webinars like this one today that happen like each month or so. There is a uh, lot of challenges that are held throughout the school. So participating in those ones is really a good opportunity to hone your skills. And there's also job opportunities. As Maxine said, there is uh, posts every day about uh, companies looking for people to hire. And also, as Jeff mentioned, uh, some people in the school, whether it's students or alumni, start their own games, their own businesses, and are looking for people to collaborate with. And who is best for that from students? So this way I found myself working both with Jeff in his project, and I recently got hired into another indie game as a level designer. So yeah, that's great. And back to you, Jeff. So uh, before I talk a little bit about uh, what our role is as a technical assistant, I also wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, sort of experience I've had uh, that uh, CG Spectrum has provided for me, uh, uh, one of which has been, um, I recently graduated, so of course I've been doing interviews and things like that. Um, and as a programmer, uh, you get tests a lot of time. You know, they'll have programming tests that they'll ask you to fill out. And my mentors, uh, my mentor Elias and even Faraz, uh, has been gracious enough to kind of review these tests with me. Uh, you know, break down the different questions they're asking and highlight certain things like that, you know, they're asking you this question, this is important, you know, this is, you know, they're looking for something really big here. Uh, and this is sort of the main point of what they're looking for. Um, and so that's really helped me kind of, you know, break down my own programming tests. In fact, I just had a uh, review with one of the companies I was interviewing with yesterday who uh, looked at the test I submitted and said it's one of the, the best they've actually seen submitted to them. So, and that's a large part thanks to my mentor and to Firas and, and CG Spectrum for kind of helping me along the way. Um, and on, on an, in addition to that, you know, as, as I mentioned and Alexia said, uh, I've been able to form a team of the project I'm working on right now uh, out of the 11 members that are actually working on the game, eight of them are CG Spectrum students. So it's just created this, this environment, this opportunity uh, for me to get to know people and across different roles, you know, not just, just outside of the programming department too, because you have access to different channels and you can chat with other people from the art side of things and, and the game design side of things as well and just get to know each other, which is really, really special in my mind. So uh, with that being said, you know, us as TAs, our kind of job here is to offer help and guidance for, for students. You know, sometimes the, the mentors, they get busy with, um, you know, they have full-time jobs or there's a time zone difference and things like that. And so they, while they will always answer your questions, sometimes there's this, this gap in between. And so that's, that's where we're uh, sort of there to fill in that gap and uh, maybe answer some questions when, when a, a, a mentor can't really get to it right away. Um, and the other thing we do is we help uh, work with the mentors to create these challenges. Um, uh, I, myself, uh, myself and uh, for us have been creating what we call game mechanic challenges, where we sort of come up with game mechanics for programmers to, um, uh, it's a different one every month that they have to, we'll kind of build and program the experience up to a certain mechanic, and then we'll remove the code for that one mechanic and ask the students, okay, uh, you guys build this out this mechanic and, and share with us uh, how you did it in your approach. Uh, and then we're here to give feedback and things like that. And so that is one of the things that we do. Um, obviously the challenges are different between the, the departments. Uh, but another thing we do is, is uh, we have interviews with the mentors. Um, they also do these open sessions where they'll go through and essentially do another live lesson uh, outside of the normal lessons that you get uh, where they get to tell you uh, 
specific instructions, maybe things that they think you're not getting quite from the content or you know, people have had a lot of questions on. Um, and so it, it becomes really personal for you. Um, but yeah, that's our That's role. awesome. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing that information. And I think, um, you know, to kind of echo on some of the stuff that you guys were saying, um, it's not just the mentors that are going to be able to help um, with education and helping you get a job and get connected. It really is your peers, your, your, your fellow students. So, because, um, you know, when one of you gets a job, you're ultimately going to be at that studio and they're going to be like, hey, you know, we have some more openings on the team and you're going to look at your Rolodex and it might be pretty thin, except for the people that you went to school with. So that community really becomes a, a real good um, tool for you as well. And then, you know, when you go to different studios, there's always that fund referral bonus. But when that student gets that job that you help them with, they're going to remember that. And then that kind of you literally like sometimes leapfrog jobs and help each other. It's, literally what happened with me for several of my jobs. And, you know, as soon as I started working with CD Spectrum, I looked at my Rolodex and I was like, oh, peers, friends, come on, this school's amazing, come help out. So yes, uh, I, I think that's great that you, you brought up uh, helping each other out and getting involved in each other's projects because there is no, um, to succeed really in this industry and even in the school, you can't lone wolf it. You have to really embrace the idea that anything you do will be part of a team. So um, no better time to do that than while a student. So now I want you to hear from our alumni and another fancy video. My name is Pietro Trizzullo and I studied foundation of VFX and game design and advanced 3D modeling. And I'm currently working as a freelance 3D modeler and character artist for games and as a teaching assistant here at the school. So my name is Noor, Noor Fillings. I studied the game art and animation course here at CD Spectrum. Um, and then I got a job in the industry. Uh, I work as a junior 3D artist at Replica, which is a character company here in the Netherlands. I am Loris Casagrande. Uh, I'm studying uh, right now the, the game design courses uh, at GD Spectrum. Yeah, I'm working as a game designer at uh, Stormmind Games. Hi, my name is uh, Reed Yerian. I've just recently finished uh, a diploma in uh, Nuke Visual Effects Compositing. I'm currently now working at uh, a visual effects studio called Stage 23 VFX in Sydney. I always loved games. I, I played them since I remember, but I wasn't considering this as a possible path for my career before I came across CG Spectrum. There are so many schools out there and I was specifically looking for a school that had very uh, individual schedules where I could do like a small class or maybe even individual classes. I wanted to make sure that I want to get my money's worth. <laughs> and I really want to make sure like, okay, whatever I'm going to put into this dream, I want to get get it out of it, like triple the amount um, when it comes to like experience and stuff that I'm learning. The Spectrum was a remote and also I looked at the mentors and they seemed very expertized. All of their mentors are currently working uh, in uh, as professionals in the industry. So I was wanting to basically get a place where uh, all the knowledge that I was getting was up to date. CG Spectrum helped me develop as an artist in a few ways. Uh, firstly, I, I gained the confidence to share my work. Secondly, because of the way the courses are structured, I felt like I was given the means to pursue my career path and achieve my, my end goal. CG Spectrum definitely helped me develop as an artist, uh, understanding what it takes. Um, it's not only uh, technical skills that you require, um, it's a mixture of soft skills, uh, understanding how to deal with feedback. Uh, it really helped me approach challenges with uh, a new uh, a, a new mind, a challenge of mind that okay, I am overcome this and I try to do my best. I do really feel like one of the strengths of CG Spectrum is their mentors. Uh, they're all professionals that have years of experience in the industry and they were always there to support me and give critiques and they were always a source of motivation and knowledge. That They talk a lot about what's happening in the industry so not necessarily uh, the stuff that you're making for school but actually what they're expect 
uh, of you when you actually enter the industry because it's very different than studying and I think it's very important to be very prepared for that. The online community of CG Spectrum is amazing. It's friendly and welcoming and it really feels like a, a safe space where you can start and move your first steps into getting other people's feedback and getting used to critiques, which is very important. There's a huge community on Slack. So they're all people who have a similar mindset to you. They want to work in this industry. They want to get there no matter what. They love what they're doing. It's really nice to have people around you that are doing the same thing and are at least as focused as you are or just as, as curious as you are and people that maybe in the future you will work with. There are the community that is uh, very supportive. Uh, uh, there are the TA that help you if you have some problem. Uh, all the mentors, you are always free to contact them. Uh, there are also other type of meetings sometimes uh, on um, mental health uh, and uh, Maxine happy hour where you can chat and meet people. Uh, my experience with the online community was really, really good. Actually, one of the hesitations that I had slightly about learning online uh, was not being able to be there and meet fellow students. I was pleasantly surprised at how uh, awesome everyone was and willing to help each other and, and share information. And then uh, I basically realized that I, even though I wasn't physically in a classroom, my peers that I was starting to network with were already located all around the world. So it, was, uh, it turned out to be much better. Start on your portfolio <laughs> while you're studying, because you want to have something to show for when you graduate. Make, make small challenges for yourself. Do weekly drills like the rookies or do any other competitions like the MSI Creator Awards. I know that uh, as an artist, you pour your heart and soul into your work and sometimes uh, getting feedback can hurt sometimes. Uh, and you just need to remember that it's not personal. Uh, you need to learn soft skills as well uh, and that's more to do with like how to communicate with people. I know sometimes it's difficult, it's a bit shy but you know just you got to lean into the pain, lean into the things that make you feel uncomfortable until you do become comfortable with them. If I have to describe my experience as a spectrum uh, in short I think it is fantastic. I really think the school uh, is uh, try to give you all uh, the preparation you need to actually start work. Uh, it's not uh, only learning uh, something theoretically, you are uh, ready to work uh, as soon as you exit the school. I can confirm that it's uh, the good school. <laughs> um, cool, so I hope that that video helps. Um, basically, you know, we're trying to help you accelerate your career with CG Spectrum. Um, you're going to learn the latest game development techniques by top studios. You're going to train with industry standard tools. You're going to get software licenses included with your course, and you're going to have an active online community to support you. So you're getting everything that you could possibly need uh, to really succeed. And, you know, obviously you need to be a motivated and passionate um, student as well, which will always suit you um, to success. So if this is interesting to you, uh, you can enroll by February 25th and start in March. You just have to go to cgspectrum.com um, slash game development. Beyond that, we have a uh, game day open uh, offer. So you get a free CG Spectrum t-shirt when you enroll in one of the courses before February 25th. Uh, you'll be able to start your course on either March 7th, April 4th, or May 2nd. But then also we'll be doing a follow-up email where uh, we will share the, this presentation itself. And then you'll have the ability to actually fill out a short survey and enter to win a $250 uh, Amazon gift card. So that's fun. Everyone loves money and shirts. Beyond that, we have some free resources. Um, this will be shared again once you are signed up with uh, when, we, when we share this. Uh, YouTube for Troy and Simon's uh, streams. We have uh, webinar replays on our cgspectrum.com webinars. And we also have a game dev career guide. Um, so watch your email for, uh, for that as well. And then beyond that, we are also doing uh, a CG Spectrum podcast 
So if you enjoyed me and Maxine going back and forth uh, during the career section, it is literally us as, um, you know, we will talk about people from um, senior level from film and from the game industry. We'll uh, talk about different jobs, what it's like to work with them, um, go behind the scenes, talk about your favorite films, games, get career advice from them. So it's really another uh, industry, uh, really service that we're trying to provide with CD Spectrum, where we're trying to pull back the curtains on some of our favorite projects and, you know, have conversations with people that we know we've worked with before. So um, it's pretty fun. Uh, and we got a, a bunch of them in the, in the works and I'm excited to have you take a listen to them. So excited for those. Yeah, it should be pretty Yay. funny. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, thank you for taking time. Um, we're not wrapping up yet, but I just want to say thank you. Um, here's some links. Um, we are active on almost, you know, like I don't think we're on TikTok, but, you know, we're on YouTube, uh, Instagram. Oh, we're getting on TikTok. On I TikTok? heard, I heard oh. we're on TikTok now. Yeah, we're, correct, we're officially correct. talking. Oh. Tick, TikTok. <laughs> Uh, but but for each of those, you know, we're, we're sharing updates on either student work, uh, like webinars we're doing, um, some fun talks. So, um, you know, we try to keep, uh, stay active on all those um, social profiles to get make sure that you always have an uh, influx of resources. Uh, let's go with some Q&A. So I'm going to um, kind of rock out some of these Q&A questions that seem to be the most common ones we have. And then afterwards, um, we'll take a look at the actual Q and A inside of um, this particular presentation. So please, you know, keep feel feel free to keep on asking questions, like random questions, whatever. It can be my favorite game too. I don't care. But you know, take advantage of the time you have with all of our mentors and staff right now. So to start off with, how many of your teaching staff are working in the industry right now? Uh, answer all of them. Um, that's the whole goal for this. Is um, you know we. But we're very big on making sure that the, what we teach is, is the most up-to-date, efficient ways that are in the industry. Um, and, you know, we, we work, you know, luckily we work with some amazing mentors who work full-time jobs and take it on their time to, like, work with us as well. So um, very, very thankful for that. Um, who wrote your curriculum? What makes it better than other schools? Uh, our amazing heads of animation, heads of like games in our, our department, um, you know, they're, they're truly, they've worked on some amazing content. And I think it's not just the projects they've worked on, it's the fact that they've worked on them for such a long time. Because you can start to see trends of like, you know, um, I mentioned before that I've been doing games now for 20 years and I've been through five console generations and I've worked in a bunch of different genres. You start to see, no matter what genre, no matter what hardware or software we're using, there's these trends that really don't leave. So, you know, we try to make that a strong foundation of the content we're creating. And obviously, we want to highlight this certain hardware and software that's relevant to the particular um, uh, console generation or um, tech that's there. But the idea is that we, uh, everything that we create, um, our mentors, our faculty, everyone has their hands into the industry. Um, and it's varying degrees and varying roles and uh, that variety and that kind of um, like the, the difference that we're all bringing to allows for, uh, and I've been part of so many of these curriculum planning sessions, it's not something that's just glazed over. These planning sessions are weeks, months planning, um, like, like we, we scrap things, we try things and we, we evolve and um, it's the passion that is actually driving this curriculum um, and enthusiasm that you know, we're all excited to actually take the course itself after we finish it. Um, so hopefully that, that helps. How many of your students get jobs in the industry? Now that's, I feel like that's always a, um, a loaded question. It's kind of hard because it, it doesn't, I, I don't want you to think about it as, a, a, you know, I'll let Maxine kind of um, jump on this after I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a great question about our placement rates. So right now I was just working on pulling some more data in the past couple of days, and we're now sitting at about uh, 70 to 80% placement rate across all of our courses from the years of 2018 to 2020. Um, I'm still working on pulling more data from 2021. So we'll have new stats uh, soon as people start to graduate. So a lot of our 2021 students still haven't graduated yet. So we got to give them, give them some time to find a job. Right. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we're sitting about, um, you know, how many students get jobs. But again, I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to have a strong portfolio. Uh, it's not just enough to have this you know, certificate once you finish our courses, it really is about 
showing your work, showing what you can create. Um, I think Jeff and Alexios were amazing examples of how, you know, they've been really pushing themselves to not just do their weekly assignments, but they're working on stuff on the side. They're working on these side projects and all this stuff to really take what they've learned and apply it to something unique. So that's why they're getting job offers and interviews and tests <laughs> a little bit earlier than, than some other people. So yeah, if you do things like that, and if you really push yourself um, like Jeff and Alexios have, then you'll be, you'll be right up there too, getting jobs um, sooner rather than later. Oh, you know what, before, before we look to some of those more specific questions, I wanted to save this one. People are asking about your PC specs. Who wants to go first? Simon. Simon's got the whole real-time background. Simon, what are you running right now? Tell us about your computer. Well, I actually did answer one question already that uh, covered this. And it's uh, one thing oh, that's sorry. interesting when you're doing, well, no, I mean, uh, this is good. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the game development is interesting because you're actually working uh, for uh, your consumer who's also running your project in real time. So you need to make sure that your specs actually do align with what your consumer is going to have. And so some of the things that you, you might make a mistake is you buy these specialty video cards that are designed for architecture or like, you know, have the very, very specific hardware. But meanwhile, nobody owns these cards except for like the very elite. And they're producing weird artifacts and bugs in your software that you wouldn't see in any other computer. So you really should be using the same type of hardware that your consumer is going to be having. And that might be consoles, right? You might need a dev kit to be able to run your hardware or your, your game development on to be able to see and represent exactly what you're going to expect from, uh, from the consumer. <laughs> Anyone else want to tell us about their specs? I have a, I usually just, so I have a, a Dell and I have a, a Razer laptop and just get lots of RAM and I have a lot of storage and I, I just got a, a good NVIDIA uh, card in there. So again, uh, I feel like, you know, there's a, a lot of good um, reference points out there. But you know you don't want to touch to Simon's credit. Yeah, you don't have like some crazy machine that then you can never uh, like. It, it's it's nice to have just a nice standard one because you don't need to go super crazy, especially because technology is like catching up, and you can save yourself some money. Multi-threading mm -hmm. on a lot of the machines, Unreal and a lot of the engines don't actually use a lot of the extra cores. So if you have like four or eight cores in your machine. Um, that's fine. You don't need to go to like a thread ripper with these 32 cores that cost you $10,000. Like that really actually doesn't speed up your development time that much. It really doesn't even help you in the development. And like they said, you're, you're working on a machine that's there. So get, you know, a good solid four to eight core AMD or Intel machine, a GeForce like 2060 or better generally, you know, and then 64 gigs to 128 gigs of RAM. RAM is really a big thing to make your levels work good. And and so a good, really mid-level machine is fine. You do not need to spend top dollar on a good machine and put SSD hard drives in. That's also a big thing I found lately um, that helps tremendously. Like sometimes like a 10X speed increase having SSDs over traditional platter hard drives. So that's my recommendation. Does that appease all of the, the viewers? Do you, do you want to hear more? But I think we should move on to some other questions here. <laughs> I have an MSI laptop, but I just use it for chatting. So, I mean, I, I think I'm, it's a little bit overkill on my end. Uh, we have one question that's been up here from the very beginning of our presentation is, can I work from home? So two answers. First of all, if you want to um, learn from home as a student, yes, that is the whole point of our school we are 100 percent online but you know how about everyone here are we working from home right now from our yeah. other jobs yeah yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> even before, before pandemic happened yes, i was working from home for epic so uh i, I obviously like the, the remote stuff depends on the studio but and and also that depends on how you present yourself to these studios because you have to you know it's like you're an investment. So you have to show someone that they can trust you that you're going to do your job remotely. So. Mm. Yeah, a, a lot of it, like I talked to a lot of students about this, like when I do my career counseling, um, when it comes to freelance work specifically, you really have to develop that level of trust with, with people like that they trust that you'll actually get the job done because if you've never worked before, they're, they're making a big risk by, by hiring you for a project. So you have to really have a strong portfolio so people trust that you can do something um, by yourself. I did see one question before as well about well, like, what can I do um, to um, you know, get a career in, in games if there are no studios close to me. So what suggestions do we have for some people? I know Alexios, like you're in Greece. I think you had this question 
a few months ago is like, what can I do if there's no big studios around me? So Alexios is a perfect example of of what to do if there isn't anything close to home. So what did you do, Alexios? Tell us about how you got into the industry. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty much what I said before when I talked, uh, connect, talk with people, ask what they do and what they're making and give feedback, ask for feedback for your project. And well, the more you connect, the more you're going to get noticed. And the more you're going to get noticed, somebody will ask you, to do something for them or somebody will uh, recommend you to work for someone so basically mm-hmm. that's it and yeah. also there's like other opportunities too like game jams um, I, I know that one of the students who asked that question is from Kazakhstan and we actually have one of our TAs our um, technical assistants in the other program modeling program he is from Kazakhstan so you're not the only one from Kazakhstan you can maybe connect with with Marat and, and chat with him, um, or you can do other online things to get yourself out there. Game jams, work on like indie projects, like the one that Jeff's working on to try and build your portfolio. So it's not just about those big studios. People come to me and like, they only wanna work at Blizzard, but there are so many other ways to get your work out there aside from those big studios. Yeah, if, if I may also suggest mm. um, one thing I did uh, a lot of to find some of the contract work that I've done so far is there's Discord channels. There's a lot of Discord's really big in gaming. Uh, there's un- there's an Unreal channel specifically that I joined that has Unreal developers, and there's literally a job section that posts contract work, paid work, all sorts of stuff. So, um, and the other thing is just put your work out there. You know, uh, have your you know we've said it a lot here, but portfolio, portfolio, portfolio is is just get yourself out there, get yourself in front of people, let them know that you can do what you're saying you can do. You know, prove it to them. Um, and and you'll get noticed eventually. So we actually had a, a webinar like earlier or later last year where um, we were talking about taking advantage of actually marketplaces too. Uh, like yes. uh, one of our mentors, Clinton, for example, he started taking some of his scenes and putting it on the Unreal Marketplace and then people are buying it. And then he's like, well, I'll do some assets. And then people are buying those. And then who are buying those things? Not just hobbyists, studios. And the studios started coming to him asking a figure. So you... you to, to be blunt, you have so many opportunities. I remember when I was in college, I had to blindly put my demo reel on a VHS tape and set it off to something without an email to return it, fingers crossed. So now that you have social media, you have YouTube, you have like marketplaces, it, take advantage of that stuff. And, but also be understanding that nothing happens overnight. Like it, it's a like the social media, the internet, it is bloated with content. So how do you make yourself stand out? You just got to be consistent and you have to also take, take the pressure off of yourself from assuming that you'll get a job right away. Sometimes people don't. Uh, a really good friend of mine who was my boss for a long time at Activision, who's now like one of the higher ups in my dog, he didn't get a job for five years and after he graduated college. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, but it, it's your passion and your persistence that is going to ultimately win you that, that, that gig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to, it's not really part of that question, but just to piggy up, piggyback off that, um, one of the things I talk to students about when we're planning their career is, is like, what are your options? You know, some people who might be younger, I know we have some young people here, someone said that they're 15, Delta Dove is like 15, um, just waiting those two months until they're old enough to join our course. Um, so someone like you, if you still live with your parents, you don't have to pay rent, you have a little bit more freedom with your time to spend more time on your portfolio, you know, because you don't have to worry about eating, you don't have to worry about paying bills. And so you can spend a little bit more time actually making your work look good. Whereas somebody who, you know, has responsibilities, like we have some students who are older, they have kids, their parents, some of them have full-time jobs. That was another question someone asked is, can I work a full-time job and go to school? Yes, absolutely. But it's going to be a little bit harder. You know, you're going to have to find that time and maybe think about another option. Like maybe your portfolio isn't good enough right away for a AAA game studio. So what I talked to some students about is, okay, well, how can we get that foot in the door 
another way then, you know, because you need a job right away to feed your kids, pay your bills. So maybe we look at other options for entry-level roles, like a QA tester, and you can eventually become a game designer or, you know, there's so many other roles out there that you can consider. It's not just the, the big ones that we're talking about. So um, yeah, it's all about options in your personal situation. And that's something I love to, to plan out and work out with different students. Um, I'd like to add just to that, yeah, yeah, like please. you don't want to put so much pressure on yourself for getting a job and you shouldn't like, you know, be so fixated. Like, I mean, of course you're, you're doing this to get a job and it's like great to work in the AAA space. I have a student who actually uh, is doing this to make their own games uh, and their own company, like their own company, because they've been in the AAA space uh, for a long time and that's not what they want. So I think the getting the job part comes from the confidence that you have because like it's not when you get a job that's it and it's like okay now I can if you're not confident at the job you're going to be again kind of like learning and keeping up so like really what you want is to take this as a way to become confident in your skill and that shows through your portfolio and that's how you will get a job and you'll also be better at interviews and through doing more you'll gain confidence. So like, if you just follow the content, it'll be great. But if you're like, as Maxine said, doing game jams, um, you know, taking on side things and it helps when you have more time, of course, when you don't have time, then you don't have that luxury. But like, really the goal is to just be confident in what you do. So like, if no videos are presented to you, can you sit down and do something? And if you can't, then, you're not learning, you're copy and pasting. So that's the key thing is build confidence is that's what we want you to have when you leave here. And that's why you have mentors to like, you know, be kind of sometimes blunt with you and tell you like, hey, this isn't great. Um, and to help you get better uh, in a positive way. Like we don't say like this sucks or anything like, <laughs> in case that came out <laughs> wrong, but like, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's my that's advice. Okay. <laughs> There's um. There's a question that's been up in chat saying, um, wanting to be a gamer since I was a kid, trying to enter the gaming industry, how long will it take for me to be a professional? So um, I, I personally don't feel like, you know, it shouldn't, you shouldn't focus on how long it's gonna take you to become a professional. Um, just, you'll, you'll know when you know. Um, uh, when I started in college, I wasn't, confident with anything and then one day I was in class and then something clicked and then all of a sudden everything made sense to me and I saw the world as giant matrix code so you, you never know what's going to happen but I think the one thing that you can control um, is just your awareness of the industry you know it, it's very important to understand the technology and software and all that fun stuff yeah but you, you have to understand the studios that are out there the people who are actually at the studios the different job positions what they're working on their subject matter art style look at their career section like take advantage of all these free resources that you have um, and if you do that while working with a school like cg spectrum it's ultimately going to put you on a better path because if me and simon are starting off on the east coast we're going to do a road trip all the way to the west coast and he's like i have no idea what i want to do and i know exactly where i want to go and what i want to do who's going to get there first so when you think about how long it's going to take you to become a professional, you have to have a plan first. And again, like we mentioned earlier in the session, it doesn't mean it has to be your end all be all plan. It could be like, this is the job I want to work first. Maybe I'll be here for a couple of years. Maybe I'll be here for 10 years, but you need a goal. And only you are the one that can provide that goal. We're just here to help you get that way. Yeah. Also, I'll add to that. It takes a very long time until you feel like you're a professional. <laughs> like you can be in the industry and working as a job and and doing it. And there's always this sense of, I, man, I'm working with all these great people that are so much better than me. How am I here? What you know? I can't believe that I'm actually here. You know, and, am I deserving of this? And, and the the answer is yes. You know, you're there for a reason. Somebody saw something in you. Um, but it, you know, if you just go based on when you feel like you're a professional quote unquote you know you're you, that's it, to you know justin's point that's not what you focus on you focus on improving always improving always building your portfolio always you know just trying to achieve the next level um you know mm -hmm. and, and and that's something that 
not just students feel like professionals feel that I've had talks with mentors who tell me about people they look up to, you know, and, and like other people that, that inspired them. So like the, the learning process is, is really never ending. And speaking of which we have a question from uh, Lewis who's asking, I'm an older student. And one of my concerns is that getting into the industry for the first time as an older individual will be a problem. Um, quick answer. I don't think so. But uh, does anyone else have any feelings about this? I mean, I, I know of so many students who, who are older um, and they've found success. Uh, we have young students, old ones. Um, I'd say, so I don't think I'd it's say no, because you have to also remember that, again, again if you pull up like a, a, a typical career posting, yeah, they have the technical skills, but a lot of what they're looking for, I'm hoping that, you know, with age comes the ability to understand how important communication and teamwork and planning and organizing. And so there's a lot of these soft skills that, you know, to be blunt, a lot of people who are younger do not have yet because they haven't had to develop them. So I often find that people who are younger focus more on the technical side, well, they lack a little bit of the soft skills side. And people who are older think they lack on the technical, but they're basic on soft skills. So we always have like a nice meeting to meet. And I feel that, you know, game studios in general too, we don't, you know, it's, are you the right fit for the team? I don't care where you were before. I don't care. Like, you know, obviously if you have the skill sets that I need and you fit within the team, heck yeah, bring it on. <laughs> yes, perhaps. <laughs> Better so music I've... taste too. <laughs> um, another... but I always go ahead and add to that. There's an interesting thing about this industry too, is that it changes, it's changing so fast and the technology is changing so quick that like, you only need a few years of experience to like really have a good understanding of something that like you know, Unreal 5, nobody knows how to use Unreal 5 yet, like just a small number. And it's like, you can just get yourself in there and become an expert in something that just didn't exist a very short while ago. So, you know, you have avenues to be able to really capitalize, even being a young person or being an older person and, you know, and be on top of a technology. So. Yeah. And also I'm, I'm 36 years old and I'm completely shifting my career right now. And, you know, no, not a single person in the interview has looked at me and go, you seem a little, little old to be starting as a junior programmer. <laughs> you know, they, all they care about is, can I do the job and uh, can I do it well? Absolutely. And, and honestly, I mean, I, I love my young students too, because they have like this, this passion and I'm so excited to work with people who like, like Delta Dove, so active in the chat, um, who, who like already know what they want to do with their life. That is so special that you came to that realization so early. But what I love about some of the, the older students or the ones that are shifting careers that are like switching careers from another industry is there's more of a fire under them, you know, like they have to get this right. And so their drive and their um, motivation and their work ethic on, on average for, with the students that I've talked to who are older, um, they're, they're a lot stronger. And I love working with them because they really take it seriously. This is like their second shot at something. And, and so they, you know, come back to me with questions faster. They like do their updates faster. They're, they're on top of stuff and they have the work ethic um, to, to match it. And so, yeah, I don't think it matters, but, um, but if you are older, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't worry too much. And if you're younger, get, get on it, focus on those soft skills too. Don't just focus on the, the school assignments uh, and try and get yourself out there. Next question we have here um, from Laura, is a pathway in the real-time program inside the film industry? I'm trying to, I was looking at that question for a while. I'm trying to figure out what you does mean that, by that, Laura. Does that mean, will that real-time program get you inside the film industry? Yeah, somebody? that's what I'm thinking. Maybe. If so, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. oh, there yeah. we go. Laura's saying yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you feel that uh, Simon, maybe? Like, that's your baby. Yeah, yeah, Simon. Um, I'm sorry, I'm missing the question. What was the, how does it work? Like, is, is there a pathway in the real-time program, like, does that lead you to the film industry, not just games? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a new industry. This is what's so interesting about it is that we don't know what exactly it's going to look like in a couple of years, but we know that they're, everybody's very invested and very interested in knowing how to make this pipeline work. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely merging. The industries are merging. Like movie film studios are investing millions and millions into these uh, LED walls and changing their whole system, and they're all reinventing it. And this stuff is happening like today, like it's just crazy how recent all this, everybody's just trying to digest how this, how this works and then, um, and then capitalize it and become the, the leader of, of this type of industry. So um, it's definitely connected to the film industry. It's just a matter of untangling 
how exactly uh, what your job is, looks like, <laughs> which is the challenge. I'm going to go to some of the questions that we have answered already, because some of them I did want to get like um, some other people here to, to help answer them. And one question we have here from James is, um, is it better to have a portfolio that's specified to a specific job or rather have a jack of all trades portfolio? Also, do employers care about certificates and degrees given from colleges? So I'll answer the second part of that question first. So do employers care about the certificates given from colleges? Yes and no. Um, in my, you know, background, nobody ever in a job interview asked me where I went to school. It's all about the portfolio and your, your previous history. That being said, what a certificate does give you is kind of that base level of knowledge where they know, okay, I've spent this much time on something. You, you've put an effort into this particular area. But that being said, some people learn these things on their own. There are resources out there. Um, and so, you know, some students come to us with bachelor's degrees and then they come to CG Spectrum. Some students go just to CG Spectrum and that's it. And they're still successful in finding jobs. So it really is mostly about your portfolio and not so much about the degrees or certificates. Um, will it help you? Of course, more knowledge is more knowledge that nobody can take away from you. Um, but in my opinion, it's, it's a lot more about the resources and the support you get to build a good portfolio um, here from CG Spectrum. But what about that other question? Is it better to be a jack of all trades um, or what we call a generalist I, I or have my own thoughts something on specific? This. I think everyone, yeah, I think so, so there's no right answer, is, but you tell yeah, us. So my own thought is if um, it's a, it, there's a lot of people trying to get their foot in the door and there's a lot of jobs, but not enough jobs. So for example, let's just say you're trying to get a job at Naughty Dog. Do not apply to Naughty Dog job saying I'll work anywhere and do anything. If it's down to you and one other person who has the same amount of talent, and I see the one person has a, a, a portfolio, which is great, but it's like Blizzard style, uh, Last of Us style, DreamWorks style. And they're basically showing off all this different stuff. I'm like, ah, I don't know what they want to do. But someone else is like gone in and they've taken the time to recreate content from The Last of Us or Uncharted, for example. And it's specifically showing off that they understand the subject matter, their art style, and they care about the studio and they've done their research. I will take that person because, again, from a business standpoint, not just they can hit the ball, uh, they can hit the ground running in terms of like jumping into the pipeline. But if they care that much about the studio and they're showing that they care that much about their studio, I'm pretty sure they're a safe bet to at least work there for a couple of years, as opposed to someone that's like, I want to work anywhere. They might be distracted by the new shiny car driving by saying, well, I'll go work there next. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I don't know. I am that guy. <laughs> I am the jack of all trades. I, uh, you can see it on my website, my portfolio. I took, I went to school for modeling. Uh, I actually, my first college uh, experience that I wanted to do was voice acting. So I did um, uh, audio engineering to help build my reel, and and uh, you know, and then I eventually did three D modeling and animation, uh, and. You know, I, it was all me experimenting and trying to figure out what it is that I want to do with my life. And then I worked in the industry as QA and worked with programmers a lot. Um, but it wasn't until I started programming that I, I felt that I wasn't getting fatigued at it. You know, I, I enjoyed doing it. I could do it 12 hours a day and, and not really notice. Um, but I, you know, it is my experience, has it hindered me? No, it's actually helped quite a bit because I can communicate with virtually any department in the games industry and, and and know what they're talking about. I can talk to modeling about topology. I know I've done rigging and all this different stuff. So it has helped me um, in my interviews. Um, but I would say that it, it, you need to also have a clear focus. You need to un know what you like to do best. Even if you can do all these different things, find something that you like to do best, focus on that and, and have your, your main reel, your main portfolio, focused on the one thing that you like to do best because that's what will get their attention and then the other stuff will help yes it will help you um, stand out uh, amongst the crowd but uh, you still want to be able to focus on something yeah like what Jeff's saying I had that struggle when I first got out of college um, they taught me to be a generalist and I was doing my best with all this like a horizontal level of quality and nobody hired me and I got tons and tons of rejections and then on my own, I just started working with a mod team and started making animations with them and working on just animation, just character game animation. And, uh, and that's what got me in my first job. So 
it depends on the size of the studio you're shooting for. You know, the bigger the studio, the more narrow your skill set they're looking for. So um, if you're looking for a small indie team, yeah, being a generalist is super useful. But if you're trying to get into a bigger studio like Naughty Dog, then you got to like hone it in to exactly what they need. That, that's, a, that's a great answer. And that's kind of what I tell students as well when I counsel them. It's like, it all depends on the situation, the type of job you're aiming for. And so that's what I help students with is to research this stuff, you know, look at the size of the company, look at the jobs that they do have or what's even in their job description. And that will help you determine what you're good at. We have some great generalist alumni students and we have some people who are specialists who are good at one thing. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. It all depends on the path you want to take. Um, but yeah, typically big studios, more specialized, small studios, more generalist. That's like <laughs> the easy answer. <laughs> um, oh, this is a great question. Um, I want to ask, how do professionals deal with procrastination when working from home during these times? So I, I think you, I think, um, I think most creatives tend to wait to the last minute sometimes, no matter what it is to get a test done. I know I am sometimes, but I think it's just you know, the older you get or more you're in a situation, you start to understand uh, how you function. Like, for example, I do all my admin tasks and emails and like meetings as much as I can in the morning because I know that I hit my little lull in the afternoon. When I'm doing that, I like to maybe I'll look at some tutorials or do something that doesn't require me to talk, type or think. So I'll just watch a review or and then at night is when I do more of my creative stuff. So you have to figure out how you function. Um, and then I, I like to write my stuff out. Um, I'm pretty clear about my high level tasks I need to do and prioritizing them. Um, and you're going to slip up, I do like no one's perfect. So, you know, if there's a day that you just aren't feeling it, just be honest with your team. Like, Hey, I'm just not feeling it. And maybe that go for a walk, watch a movie, unplug. You need it. Sometimes this job is very draining sometimes. And it sneaks up on you because you think I'm not doing physical labor, but the amount of problems of you're doing is just burning so much calories and energy that you, it just sneaks up on you. You're like, why am I so tired? Well, because of that. Routine tends to help a lot too. Like getting into a pattern of doing things um, versus just sort of waking up and going, well, I'm going to work on something today or whatever, right? And and also with that, you know, break your tasks down. If you're procrastinating a lot, break them down to smaller subtasks, right? So that you know, what am I achieving maybe every day versus half a day or even not necessarily every hour, but just to force yourself to say like, I'm making progress and thinking about that way. The problem in some tasks is you might say, oh, I got a month to do this. So you think like, oh, I'll just kind of put it off and I'll put it off and then you'll wait and you'll waste a week and that kind of thing. So don't make tasks so big, you know, and by having that pressure on yourself and on the team, that'll help you kind of get motivated to like, oh God, I got to get this thing done today. Right. You know, and, but if it's, I got to get it done this week or this month that, you know, that procrastination kicks in. So that can, that can help you. And also I just find, use my schedule. Like I tell people on my phone, you know, like they're like, well, I forget about this or I don't do this. I'm like, put tasks in my phone as reminders. Block those things in with reminders. Tell me like, hey, go do this, go do this, you know, go do this. And just like you would schedule a meeting, schedule your tasks even in there. And just to remind you like, hey, got to do this or that. I even have to schedule to eat because I don't remember to eat because I get so focused. I mean, literally I'll have days I work 18 hours and I don't, you know, don't eat. I'll come home all grumpy, you know, and, and it's just like, and I realize, oh, I haven't eaten all day. And like, so I really have to schedule even my eating because I just get so focused on how, you know, when I do things, because I just, I love creating. And for me, that's fun. And I just, I lose myself in it. Right. But everybody's different and what gets you excited. Right. Yeah, and I would, I would also add like find things outside of work that get you excited and like use that as kind of like a reward thing. Like if it's, a walk, uh, an hour at the gym, a swim, something like that, like that kind of motivates you to like get something done to feel like that uh, is well earned in a sense or like do that and then be like, that was great. Now I'm like refreshed so I can do something like try to, it's hard to, I guess, uh, explain, but like if you are thinking about work, then you want to do it less because you're like kind of like overwhelmed so it's try to balance with a non-work activity to then be motivated to like be like okay well I did an hour swim so now I'm like refreshed and I feel like I can do an hour's work and try to balance it that way because yeah you need to to counter uh balance things to like not feel guilty about procrastinating and all that 
that helps Absolutely. me at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was going to add to that too. And Troy was saying like scheduling meals, like schedule time with friends and like social activity or sports. Um, but like he was saying, um, because if you're only scheduling work stuff, you're going to start to hate your schedule because it's all, all this stuff that like you don't want to do. So you have to add in that personal time too, or like plan, oh, you know what? I'm going to set aside some time on Friday to actually upload my work to my portfolio. Like maybe you've been doing all this work, but you haven't planned time to upload it. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, because that's such a good question, is that time management and learning how to be better with procrastination or, you know, managing your tasks, your schedule, that is a skill. So just like learning Unreal or learning how to code, those are all skills that you're going to learn at CG Spectrum. Um, learning how to manage your own time is a skill as well. And that takes time to learn. And if you're not actively, consciously trying to think about, okay, what went well last week? okay, I'll try to do that again this week. Or what didn't go well last week? I thought I would be productive at, at two o'clock, but you know, like Justin said, he's like, oh, two o'clock, three o'clock, I can't get anything done. So maybe you should schedule your more important tasks in the morning and then save that time for something else. Like, obviously he's like really got into the groove of figuring out when his zone is, um, but that takes time. That takes like years of practice and figuring out like what times you work the best at, what, what days of the week even, especially if you're a freelance or, or a student and you don't have the, you know, a studio giving you a schedule, that makes it a lot easier to work is when a studio tells you, you have to be in this meeting at I this would, time, okay. this review, like. I would also try to like bookend your days. Um, Cause like Troy mentioned too, the, the, the blessing and the curse of doing something you love is that it can, they can get away from you because you get sucked in the zone. I've just been times where I can't go to sleep because I'm just so excited about what I have to work on in the morning. Um, but if you bookend your days with more of your healthy habits or anything else you have to do, it, it's good to kind of find a way because, you know, there, there, I've heard people say, I don't know like, I, how like true this is, but the shelf life sometimes of a developer can be seven years. But those are the people who are like burning themselves out because they don't know when to stop and move forward. And I, I feel like you can avoid burnout in just by life. I mean, it's like, so if someone gives you a large pizza, just don't eat the whole large pizza. Like anything in life, you just pace yourself. Don't well, tell me what to do, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat that pizza if I want to. The analogy is really bad. I'm going to eat the pizza. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I can't relate. Really, I can't relate really to that. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, no, if you pat if you like if you book in your days and uh, uh, like I, I try to do that like I try to do all my healthy stuff in the very beginning of the day wake up so that way I don't feel terrible about it at the end of the day if I didn't do it and then at the end of the day I try to unplug I'll I'll read a read or I'll watch a movie or like staying great and then like on the weekends like a Sunday I will do nothing I will not look at my my computer or any screen at all because you know sitting and looking at things you know it's not the best but you know you do things in balance and it's completely fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. We have time for two more questions. We have one quick one that I'm going to answer right away. Actually, Rex, thank you, Rex, for answering. Yeah. Every month you can enroll. So someone just asked to enroll in a program. Is it March every year or is there one in September when I can enroll in a course? Yeah, we do intakes every single month. There is a cutoff date. Um, I think in the last, uh, one of the last, uh, two weeks of the month to start in the next month. Um, but yeah, every month we're doing it. So no worries. You can figure out what time works for you. And one last question here. This was one that we, we kind of answered in the past, but I just want to get our panel here, uh, get their thoughts. So James asked, how about job experience? Say, for example, I just completed finishing CG Spectrum and I got a pretty portfolio looking nice and flashy. Can I go straight to AAA studios? I see for some studios, the requirements are like having two to three years of experience under your belt. Oh, what do I do there? Um, so again, I think it depends a lot on the quality of your portfolio. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts? I know like for us, Scott, you guys have actually hired people. Um, how do you feel about that? If someone has an amazing portfolio, but they haven't worked in the industry yet, would you hire them? I have never hired anybody because of their degree. Not once. I hire yeah. them because of what they can do. And the, the problem with, with those requirements for, for degrees is that it's not really coming from the team. And I'm not... I'm not criticizing people in HR, but they use that as kind of a standard metric so that they can kind of filter incoming resumes 
and keep the flow down and have some reason to believe that this person at least has some idea what they're doing. The reality is the degree doesn't matter. What matters is can you do the work? And you got to be able to show that you can do the work. So if you have a flashy portfolio and it isn't relevant to the people you're talking to, or you have a flashy portfolio, but it isn't really that well executed, that's a problem. But if you really do have, have the chops, people will be interested. I actually hired a guy once because of something he showed me on his phone. He just held up, the, held up his phone and said, I, I wrote this and I was playing a game. And that's the kind of thing that can have a huge impact. So as far as I'm concerned, top of the list is portfolio. Yeah, I mean, um, when I was at Midway Games way back in the day, we released a piece of concept art for a game I was working on, Stranglehold. We weren't even hiring and someone got a hold of it and they built the scene of the concept art in a week. And I remember that. Yeah, we yeah. hired them like right off the bat. So yeah. I think if you look at the bullet points that a job is asking you for, let's say there's 10 and the 10th bullet point uh, is the, the, hey, we need two, three years experience, but you're presenting all nine that you can do it. I think any hiring um, uh, personnel is gonna be like, you know what, this person's great. And again, this is all business. I can probably get you a little bit cheaper than the person that has like two to three, four, whatever, like, which is the reality of things. If you can think that way, but, um, and then maybe that's the way that you, you spin it. Like, hey, I know that I don't have that experience, but I'm eager, I'm younger. I'm gonna probably be better on your bottom line and I can grow with the company. So you gotta sell yourself as much as like they have to sell you. But keep in mind also that when you're making a portfolio, it's not just about the end result. I mean, the end result is probably gonna open a door for an interview, but if you can't talk to talk and you still can't do it in a reasonable manner, it may not necessarily get you the job as well, right? It's like with game design, I'll see an amazing level and I'm like, okay, how did you build that, right? And if it took them five years to build it and all these kinds of things, you can say like, well, it looks great, but I need you to build that in a week, not in, you know, in a year. And then what was your thought process of how you went through and how you built it? That interests me a lot more than just even the finished product. So a lot of times I recommend, even in your portfolio page, to show the process, especially in game design, of how did you go from an idea all the way through a final implementation to sh to see how you think. Because that's really what I'm hiring in game design, especially, is really that thought process of can you you know solve problems, right? That's a lot of what your portfolio is doing, not just that I can build some really pretty level, right? So remember that there's a, there's a, there's a journey there that you need to show in your portfolio as well in a lot of cases. Um, same thing like code. You might look at something that looks really good, but did you write really good documented code? Did you write efficient code? Did it work fast? You know, those kind of things, right? There's a lot to it that, you know, just a video of something may not show, but again, that might get you in the door and that's critical, but remember to prep for that interview because the interview, you know, and getting that job might be more than just having just a, a really flashy portfolio to Scott's point. You know, there, there's a lot more there. Another thing to keep in mind is that again, like so much of this is subjective depending on the studio you're applying to. So those really big studios, they're getting hundreds of applications when they post a job, especially if it's a junior position and something that's asking for less than five years experience. So the level of quality they end up going with in a candidate that they select is going to be higher than maybe a smaller studio that has less applications. So your chances might be higher depending on the studio that you're applying to. Um, yeah, for us is being a good point here for programmers, put code up on GitHub or GitLab, show what you can do, show that you're active in the community and that you're um, trying to like advance um, the world of programming and, and like other people can use your tools. Like if you can show that someone else downloaded your tool and used it in their own project, that's fantastic. That shows that you understand collaboration and, and like, you know, working with other people. I'll, um, I'll yeah. add to that. Actually, I, I, for me personally, I don't actually have a single piece of code that I've sent out uh, for resumes on Git, GitHub or anything like that. It's actually all videos of mechanics and stuff that I've done and worked on. And that's really what got me in the door because they're going to send you a programming test. They will know that you can program at the end of the day. Um, but uh, most most of the interviews I've had was because they uh, saw I, I was able to put together a mechanic and it is functioning in an in engine, you know, for example. So I'm not saying the, the GitHub uh, isn't necessary and it definitely will help uh, some you know, some might want to see that, but um, uh, also I, I would encourage you to just, 
even if it's just blocking out, okay, I mean, there's so many free assets and stuff on the store, you can just grab and, and show that you can make a mechanic work in engine and do a thing, you know, because that's at the end of the day, um, what they want to see. Yeah, if a picture is a thousand words, a video is like a billion. So a lot of times people don't have the time to sift through your code and other things like it's so the GitHub aspect is um, for connections like programmers that you might want to talk to to put in a good word for you, but like to actually get attention, a video, uh, which you can also put in like your GitHub uh, page, like in the description is the best because yeah, like HR is not gonna know how to read like GitHub things. And most programmers are gonna not want to, again, go through 30 or 50 or hundred uh, source code files. So if you have a video, it's like this person knows what they're trying to show me and it looks good. So let me get more info and then the, that'll open up a communication channel. So you should always uh, kind of learn how to present yourself and Maxine helps out with that, but um, yeah, that's a part of kind of selling uh, your skills is presenting it in a um, good manner in a video. Uh, I don't think there is a better way to do it, except for the way that uh, Scott, that guy like showed him his phone and gave it to him. So if you are at GDC or something, then that's better than a video. But if you're, uh, yeah, not in face to face contact, then a video is, is the way to go. Also, if you uh, enroll in CG Spectrum, that's kind of what we do with our challenges. That's why we do them with the challenges is to provide you a visual way to show that you're creating these unique. And we delete the code uh, for that mechanic, for example. And so it's your recreation of that. And we've seen students take these mechanic challenges and completely add to it, you know, where uh, the challenge was just supposed to be a little snowball fight, you know, or, you know, like you throwing snowballs at, uh, at toys and collecting toys. One student completely changed that to be this multiplayer snowball fight, you know, and so that's just uh, taking, it's just an example of their ingenuity and taking what we gave them and creating something completely uh, different. I'm going to have to cut everyone off now because we've already gone past. <laughs> Um, but thank you for everyone that uh, came up for the chat, um, all of our panelists, thank you, all of our attendees, thank you, and thank you for all the great questions. Uh, we just threw a lot of information at you. We will be sending out a recap of this with this presentation as well. Again, remember, if you choose to sign up um, before February 25th, you do get the option of a free shirt, and then uh, you will get, after you fill out a short survey, uh, opportunity to win a $250 uh, Amazon gift card. So um, hope this was informative. Uh, thank you again for sticking with us. This was a long session and uh, hope that we can start to see some of your names popping up inside of our CG Spectrum Slack channel and uh, mentor sessions. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So nice to meet everyone. Can't wait to help you.